<laughs> Hello, everyone. I, I set my camera up for sitting, but I'm going to stand it first, so I'm going to lose the top of my hair. Uh, I wanted to do a live stream because we haven't done it in a couple of weeks, and it's time. Plus, you know, we have some important things to discuss. Now, to explain why there wasn't a stream is because I was having construction done here in the house, which was very, very loud. And every time I thought, oh, well, maybe I can do something, I was like, there was no way. And uh, our weather has changed as well. So we had some weather where the temperature was like freezing cold out there. And somebody said, well, if it's a noise in the house, can you just go outside? <laughs> I was like, no, it's 48 degrees out there and the ice is melting and dripping and it just sounds like I'm standing next to a fountain. So not another option either. So they finally finished all the tile work. That is completed. I have other things I need to do now, including put it down new baseboards and finally finish painting the walls and texturing areas that uh, were fixed last summer. So uh, there's still a while to go with getting the house done, but in the meantime, the good news is all this work that was done on the, the, uh, this entire area behind me, from there to there and throughout the entire kitchen, as well as you know the bathrooms and all that, didn't affect the reef tank at all. The uh, people were super clean in what they did. And I was so impressed with the fact that he was so detail-oriented. And I mean, it was like the perfect fit for me because even though my house was in an uproar for two weeks and I had to live through the entire ordeal, which is absolutely no fun, living, sleeping, and working through it, ugh, such a beating. But the tank never skipped a beat. And the little light bit of dusting that landed on the edge of the sump was nothing compared to what I anticipated with ripping out old ceramic tile, grinding down the concrete to prepare it for the new stuff that had to go in. And then, of course, all those cuts and, and the... Uh, the application of thin set and then putting in mortar, or, or I'm sorry, not mortar, the uh, the grout, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's messy. And yet this person did a lot of the work outside. And then when the weather got really bad, he got to work in Minion's workshop. And he said, man, this is amazing. I love it. It's so comfortable. He had it completely tarped off. So I couldn't do any work either because all my equipment was covered with tarps and all his equipment was in my way to where I couldn't even get to the computer if I wanted to program something on the CNC to cut out. I just didn't have the option. So he's finally gone, which is good news. And I, but then the weather shifted again, and now the weather's beautiful. So yesterday I spent some time working on the building again for the studio because I want to desperately get in there for work and stop working in the house, which will allow me to clear out a lot of the business that's in here and put it out in the studio. And then they can come in here and they can rip out all the carpet <laughs> and replace that. And then, of course, more painting and more baseboards and it's it's it feels like it's never going to end but it's going to end it's going to end by the end of this year i'm sure everything on my hit list will have been accomplished and then 2023 i can just enjoy the the fruits of all that labor but it, it's been rough so yes there was no way i could have done any kind of stream <laughs> so i wanted to let you know that um also before i get into our topic i did want to mention one quick thing because you know we all live in different areas we all have different circumstances when it comes to weather and emergencies we are still in winter and things can still go wrong and if you've done nothing to prepare for an emergency it's time to think about it this minute or as soon as the stream is over and think about what you can do to protect your reef tank in case there is an emergency which specifically would be a power outage or a lack of heat you know because it's winter you know, these are the things that we want to address immediately. So in my own situation, I bought a brand new generator, I think last March, and I've never put a drop of gas in it. So it is brand, brand new. And I, before the ice came and we had a really cold front come through, and I mean, it was, I think our low was 14, 13, 14. It was low. It was cold. So I went out and checked the generator. I bought a brand new five gallon jug of gas because I wanted to have good fuel, not old gas from last year that may or may not want to fire properly. And then I looked at my uh, the plug on the side of the generator and I discovered that the plug that I use right now to power the fish room is a different shape than the outlet on the generator. So I went to Lowe's and I picked up a new plug. And what the difference is, Here's the giant plug. Uh, the difference is, if you can look, I'm going to kind of turn this around a little bit. This one here on the top has, sorry, right here on the top, has a little bent piece of metal going downward. And on my generator, 
it's going downward. But my plug that exists currently, the, the main cord I plug in, that part bends upward. And I knew I couldn't just like twist it around and keep going. There was no way. So I picked this up. It was probably like $28, $30. And I'm going to cut off the cord and uh, change this out. And I'm going to do it now while my weather is nice again. Because I don't want to be doing this when it's 13 degrees out and pouring rain and a complete power outage. And I'm dealing with a flashlight. So today we've got sun. The temperature is going to be a whopping, what did that say? <laughs> Supposedly 57. I don't know if I believe that. But I will go out there and I'll deal with that today. So if I do need to suddenly tonight hook up my generator, I can plug this guy in and get power to the fish room to keep the reef tank healthy and, and happy. So like I said, if you haven't got anything in place yet, please do look into what you can do. Uh, power inverter is, well, the least thing you can do is get an air stone on a battery powered pump. And uh, this, you could find something like that in a bait and tackle shop to keep the bait alive in a bucket. They have those who uses a couple of D batteries and an air stone that sinks in the bottom and just puts bubbles. And if your tank is small, that may suffice. Others like to have something called a power inverter and they run an extension cord all the way, or they hook it up to their car and run an extension cord all the way in to plug in a couple of things on their tank. Battery backups are really nice, uh, but they're limited in how long the battery will last. So you have to decide, do I want to have a UPS like we use for a computer to keep it going? And will that last me an hour or two or three? Uh, do you want to do a battery array like I did last year, which will actually provide power to six different pumps for about 24 hours at normal speed? And since everything slows down on battery backup, it probably would last even longer. But I have this huge array that I set up last year. And uh, so there's that. And then I have the generator that not only provides power to the entire fish room, but it also will provide enough power for me to plug in the refrigerator and keep the food from going bad and turn on the television and get the router going so I can go ahead and stream something on Netflix. So I try to have some comfort, but I mean, I don't have any kind of like cool lighting solutions. I really should come up with some nifty LED lighting as well that I can hook up to the generator so I can you know, see what I'm doing in the house because I'm running around with candles. <laughs> this house is all electric. I don't have any features I can turn to when the power's out, I am literally powerless. So I don't have, like, I can't rely on natural gas. I have no solution. So anyway, if you want to start thinking about things you may need for an emergency, now's the time to do it. You might want to have backup heaters for those super cold nights that may be coming if you're not already going through them now. Um, you may need to wrap your tank with a blanket if the whole house loses power for a duration. I mean, these are just things. There are actually videos on this channel about this entire topic that go on for easily an hour. So I'm not going to spend it all on this one, but I just want to bring it to your attention. It's really important. <clears throat> uh, I noticed someone made a comment, and you're 100% right. He said, the L14-30 <laughs> is a locking plug. Um, the one that goes up is the L14-20. And the difference being one's a 20 amp and one's a 30. So technically my wire is um, a 20 amp wire and this would be supersizing it. And the reason being is because the generator can do up to 50 amps and I will be changing out all of that with a much better system. But for now, I know I can run my 20 amp cord, even though I have the larger plug, it'll be okay. It's just because um, my tank doesn't even pull that. It pulls much less than that. I, I don't think I pull 12 amps total in the entire reef, but um in an emergency, it's good to have power and to have something that you can plug in. Now, of course, you can string extension cords to a generator, like normal, average, everyday uh, orange cords like you see people use for construction sites. But uh, I like to be able to keep the doors and windows closed. My generator is sitting outside, making all the noise out there. None of the fumes are coming in. I don't get a headache. So that's why I have what I've got. But I do need to uh, get more components. But for now... This will get me going. And that's the whole point. Emergency backup, you're going to use emergency things that are temporary. It's not your everyday use item. Okay. So we are going to talk about reef safe fish today. And we're also going to talk about what's going on with the Lacey Act. And there's been a lot of conversation about it this week. And I want to tell you a little bit more about it in case you haven't heard a word. Maybe most of you have. Maybe some of you have not. But the Lacey Act is buried inside the America Competes Act that they are trying to pass as a bill. And when we got notification that this thing was happening, was February 1st, 2nd, 3rd, really on February 4th, we got this big call to action saying, hey everyone, 
this bill is being pushed through and they may vote on it today and they did vote on it that day we got the notification stating that the House of Representatives approved the bill and it was going to the Senate. I mean, it was 50% done. So that was kind of surprising that we weren't told anything sooner and by we, the general public. Um, so what's the big deal about the Lacey Act? I don't have like an entire list of um, specifics here. I can, well, hang on, let me do one thing that will help a little bit with this. I have too many things on my screen like usual. Let's see if I can move anything around to have some space. Move, okay, here we go. You know what, actually I have a graphic that I shared on, I've got it in my camera roll, so let me jump to that. And this graphic was actually made by USARC, which is the organization that stands behind the reptile industry. So the America Competes Act of 2022 is called HR 5, I'm sorry, HR 4521. And I, uh, it says specifically, it affects pets of all species. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read, okay? I'm sorry. I know you guys want me to be more entertaining, but sometimes I just have to read the words. And I thought they did a good job, so that's why I'm sharing it with you. This bill overturns many of the Lacey Act amendments and would have major implications on any pet that is non-domesticated, considered to be any animal that is not a dog, cat, or traditional farm animal. Animals that fall under this category will be regulated as injurious species. This will significantly affect the entire exotic animal industry, in addition to the pet trade, zoos, aquariums, and research facilities to be impacted by this legislation. It completely changes the regulatory approach for exotic animals. The current regulations operate under a blacklist, which consists of a federally prohibited species, along with any individual state bans. This bill would instead consist of a whitelist. So they're switching from a blacklist of what's on the list to a whitelist that makes things permitted. Meaning only species that were predetermined to not be injurious or an invasive, invasive species risk can continue to be imported into the United States. This dramatically shifts the regulatory approach from previously allowing individual jurisdictions to evaluate environmental and health threats to their region without impacting entire industries or private individuals. It will impact interstate transport. Under this bill, any animal that is not on the white list will not be allowed to cross state lines for any reason. This includes moving, selling, or gifting the animal to another individual, or transportation for veterinary care. The inability for these animals to be transported throughout the country will destroy the exotic pet industry. Challenging the federal regulations will become very difficult. With a shift in the regulatory process, any shift, any species that is not on the white list will require legal challenges for importation. This process will be extremely time consuming and require significant financial resources to challenge the legal status. Additionally, violations of this law can be prosecuted as a federal felony, resulting in a $20,000 fine and or five years imprisonment if found guilty. And then finally, contact your senators and tell them to oppose HR 4521. This bill was passed in the House of Representatives on February 4th. It is now headed to the Senate for consideration. To become a law, the bill must be passed by both legislative bodies in the United States Congress before it is signed in by the president. Now is the time to act. Okay, so let's kind of break that down a little bit further. If you were to have some things in your aquarium that are not on the white list, which would be pretty much almost everything you have, you could not move into a new state if this bill passes. You'd be doing it illegally. If you said, well, I live in West Virginia, but I want to live in Connecticut now because of a job offer, can't take your aquarium, can't take your critters. And it's not just aquariums. It is reptiles. It is uh, birds. I mean, it's, it's a whole list of whatever creature that could be considered injurious. So there's been a lot of debate. And of course, like every single topic out there, everyone suddenly becomes an, becomes an expert. I read this, so it's fact. Me... I am very hesitant to believe almost anything. <laughs> I'm very cautious and I'm, I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to figure out what's happening. There's been a lot of opinion that this will not pass the Senate, that it, there's just no way this would go through. But 
if it were to pass, it would take years to undo it. Not just a simple thing of getting a few things put on the whitelist. And to prove things have to be on the whitelist would be really, really difficult. So Reef to Rainforest has been releasing articles all this, you know, since this thing started to give us a heads up. I'm still moving things out of my way. Sorry, guys. Um, the first article came out on... I think February 4th, yes. And it said federal, legisla le federal legislation threatens pets, zoos, aquariums, and biomedical research. And then it goes into it. And I'll put links to all this so you can go look at them yourself because I don't expect you to just listen to me and believe me. Um, and then there was an update that came out today, February 12th, right? Today's the 12th. And it's the PJAX Lacey Act update. And this one I want to read to you because it's basically... A paragraph with a few extra tidbits. Again, I'll, I'll link you for this one as well. The threat to the responsible pet care community posed by amendments in the Lacey Act include, included in the Competes Act of 2021, because that's when it was written, is very high. These changes to the Lacey Act's shipment clause would create a negative ripple effect across the pet care community, affecting not only those that import and domestically transport companion animals, but also businesses that breed them domestically or provide products and services to care for pets. The proposed whitelist could also drastically alter the species available as companion animals. While similar changes have been proposed and successfully mitigated by the efforts of the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council, PJAC, um, and groups in the past, this one has more traction than ever before. It is critical that trade, uh, that trade activate and engage with our federal elected officials to voice their opposition to these amendments, which even if defeated this time, we expect to see again in the future. And that was written by Bob Lutkins, the vice president of uh, governmental affairs at PJAC. So think about this. Okay, so you cannot bring in something like the blue ring octopus because it's injurious. It literally could kill you in seconds. What about zoanthids? Many of you guys like those and we know that they contain palytoxin. And if just a few reports come in that this is dangerous, and you know there's stories all over the news about this stuff over the last decade, if not longer, that could be immediately considered injurious and cannot be sold, traded, gifted, or crossing state lines. What about captive bred? Okay, oh, we're not taking things out of the ocean. Now we're just going to grow them. You cannot say that the captive bred fish will cross state lines. They may not be able to. So you might have a breeder that's growing I was just listening to a podcast last night, and this guy purportedly bred a total of a million clownfish back in the day. That's a lot. Imagine if he could not cross the border of his state to sell them. What are you going to do with a million clowns? <laughs> You'd have one awesome display. But uh, no, it, it's just it's insane, right? And the thing is, federal officials, because this would be federal law, not some state law. And that means captive bread. How would they know this is captive bread and not taken from the ocean? And the law doesn't stipulate captive bread's okay. It's not on the white list. So you see, even something as simple as the friendly clownfish could become uh, impossible to get, or you have to get it by illegal means, which, you know, that kind of stuff has happened in the past. When, when there's a law in place and people don't like it, they do their thing, and they're like, I don't care. But what we're trying to do here is be aware of what's going on, and if there is something that can be done, we want to step up and do something now. And it's not just the aquarium industry. It's the reptiles. It's the birds. It's the, the other kinds of animals that people keep that uh, are also very worried. So, again, it's not like one little group is making noise. It's just that we're usually the easiest group to attack. And that's unfortunate. It's been an unfortunate thing for a long time. We are just low-hanging fruit that you can just grab and knock down with no problem at all. And we don't want that to happen. You know, we talk about what happened in Hawaii uh, a couple of years ago where they finally passed the law to close down the fishery industry. And th that was completely sustainable with proof, with real data that the fish populations were not dropping in the reefs, right? And yet it's still closed down and all these people lost their jobs and we no longer get any fish from Hawaii nor fish that had to come through Hawaii to get to the continental U.S. It's gone. It's completely closed down. You know, it's there are certain fish that we just can't get at this point anymore. And if this one were to go into effect, it could really affect things. So it is a big deal. There are um, I've watched one person specifically on Facebook that keeps saying 
it's not true, this didn't happen, it was canceled, it's been removed, but that's not true. And I had a feeling he was incorrect because if he was right and 10 other people were also saying the same thing, I'd say, okay, hmm, that's good news. It looks like we dodged a bullet. But at this point, the only way 10 other people would say it is if they believe what he said and they're just regurgitating it, which is um, obviously not a good way to transmit information. So rather than me telling you this is absolute, I'm actually telling you this is very fluid and I don't know how it's all going to play out, but there is a huge risk to what could happen in the very near future. Now, like I said, there are some uh, opinions that believe this will not pass, that the Senate will never approve it. And that's great. <laughs> Let's hope that's exactly true. Let's hope that letters to senators will bring to your attention how bad this would be for uh, for the this hobby and then from the other hobby groups that they say the same thing. Because, I mean, I've seen a lot... I mean, man, there's been a big outcry on social media through a lot of avenues I recognize, and there's other groups I don't even know about. And I was like, wow, it's even showing up over there. I'm kind of glad that more voices are being uh, heard because it can really affect a lot of businesses that are selling things that you're buying. And it's almost... It's almost like we need the biggest ones, the huge companies, to make the most noise, even though we as hobbyists want to make you know some rumbling noises too. But it's not like we hobbyists have to save the, the hobby. <laughs> I, I mean, it's nice to think that, but we don't have the leverage. We're just a guy with a tank, right? A guy or a girl with a tank. So we want to find... Um, we, we, we want to definitely voice our objections, so we are adding to the buzz but we need the big corporations that are making millions and millions of dollars every year to say to their senators, we're going to lose our companies because of this ridiculous bill. <laughs> and if you were to do that, it's going to shut down this many businesses and this many people will be unemployed and, and you know, all these things. I mean, they, we need a really big ring of support to make noise on this one. And I, you know, the funny thing is, and I'm not, 100% sure of this, but I think this started with a senator, or, well, senator? Possibly a senator. Uh, this may have started with some, a person of Congress, that's better, out of Florida. And probably because they have all those reptiles that are falling out of the trees when it gets cold. And they're like, these things don't belong here. Just like lionfish don't believe in the Hawaiian, don't belong in the Hawaiian waters. Don't belong in the Florida waters. So, they have become a plague. And so that one area definitely has a huge problem. Texas does not have that same problem with those same animals. So to create a law that affects the entire United States on a federal level about something going on in Florida doesn't make sense. And really, this should continue to be a state-to-state -state decision rather than a full-fledged across the U.S. law that affects everyone. So... Um, you can definitely look up more about this on YouTube channels because a lot of people are talking about it and get more insight and, and probably more analogies that will help clarify. But at the same time, we want to be um, you know alert to what's going on this time. And I know sometimes it seems like, well, it seems like every couple of years we have to suddenly defend the hobby. And it's because we don't have like a governing council that... You know, I've discussed this in, on this channel in the past. We don't have one group that leads the saltwater hobby. Everyone is the Wild West. Everyone does their own thing, their own way, um, has their own opinion, and, you know, just gets things however they want to get them. And if there was one body that ran the saltwater industry, that ran the saltwater hobby, I mean, literally, I know it sounds unpleasant when you think about it. It sounds like someone's going to tell me how to do this. It's like not... It's not exactly, that's not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is if there was one body that all the companies answered to or represented or supported to keep a, a, a small contingent of lawyers on hand to deal with what's happening in politics, that would be great. We don't have that, and we need that. We need a group of lawyers that stand up for the saltwater hobby. And there has to be sort of like a president of an organization that has to be the spokesperson. And everyone needs to... I mean, I heard one comment yesterday 
on Richard Ross's podcast where he had made a comment about, wouldn't it be great if wherever you, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Let me be careful I use the word great. Um, wouldn't it be interesting if whenever you bought something for your aquarium, dry goods, live goods, whatever, there was a surcharge and that search, I know you're all like, what? <laughs> if there was a surcharge on there that went to this body, this organization that actually does something to repopulate reefs. I mean, literally, this is an, it would be a thing that we could point to and say, not only do we all love our aquariums, our boxes of water in our homes, but every time I make a purchase, a few pennies or, or a dollar, whatever, goes to repopulating reefs that were destroyed off the Great Barrier Reef. You know, and you could say, and there's the proof, they've been doing this for 10 years, and this whole section is doing so much better, but we don't have anything like that. I mean, we hear about Coral Restoration Foundation where they're working over here, and there's the Bonaire Restoration thing. There is a thing going on over there in uh, Great Barrier Reef. I mean, there's different places where there are these things, but there's not like one hub where it all filters down from. And I think we need that hub. I think we've gone too long without that hub. So hopefully we as a group collectively can come up with something that we can all agree with. And even if it costs us a little bit of money out of our pockets, or we're getting one less item for our aquarium because we need to help keep this thing in place so we have lawyers that are paying attention. Because apparently the reptile industry literally has a group that USARC, they have a group of lawyers. That's their full-time job every single day is to keep an eye on what's going on. And it's like they were all over this thing way louder than we were. Okay, I'm done. I, <laughs> I don't want to go on for a whole hour about this topic. I just want to bring it to your attention. I'll provide links in the video's description. And so let us talk about reef safe fish um, while you can still get them. <laughs> because who knows what's going to happen. It's definitely a, a nerve-wracking thing. Now, what is a reef safe fish? A reef safe fish would be one that you can put in your reef and it potentially will do no harm. It will get along with its friends, its neighbors. It won't chew on the corals you care about. I mean, this is a whole delicate act and we try to find a way to put everyone um, into one box of water that comes from all different parts of the world. It's not their normal environment. When you get uh, a certain fish Let's say it is the, let's say it's the flame angel, okay? And you're like, oh my God, I love the flame angel. Well, where it comes from, it probably does not live in an area where it's just filled with scolies. <laughs> you know, scolies come from a different area. And the flame angel's like, oh, these are definitely tasty. And it starts eating them and you get all upset and you're like, I have a bad fish. I'm like, no, flame angels nip at corals and they do like LPS. And there's certain ones they really go for. So... To get a reef safe fish would be a fish that you can put in the tank with the corals you have and know that those corals will be okay and the fish will be okay and everyone gets along. So that's what I call reef safe. Now, when it comes to shopping for fish, it's a little tricky because we're, you know, we see things that are so pretty. And so we think, well, I want that because of its shape. I want it because of its color. I like its temperament. I like its, uh, you know, just the, it's, it's, it's active or it swims up high in the water all the time. So I always see it, you know, there's different reasons why we pick something out. And sometimes people just pick it out because they want a new splash of color. They look at their reef and they say, this tank needs more yellow. What yellow fish exists? Okay. I'll get that one. And that won't always work because some of these yellow fish are definitely coral devourers. I mean, it's not even like a snack. It's like, I will destroy this because it is my favorite food in the world. So we want to, you know, be aware of that. So I've got a list of fish here on my screen in front of me that I want to just talk about and bring to your attention what are typically considered safe for your reef and uh, could go really well with corals you have in your tank. Um, my list has been building over the last uh, almost 20 years and uh, it all starts off with the humble clownfish. Now there are lots and lots and lots of different kinds of clownfish and the one that I fell in love with was the true percula which is just a humble little fish that's got the orange and it's got the white stripe and it's got black borders around the white stripe. And I find it very striking. And it's funny because I was like 
I've got to own Perculas. That is what I want when everyone wanted the Ocellaris. They wanted what's called the false Percula. And people were going gaga for those things. And I'm like, no, give me a pair of Perculas and I'm happy. And I remember one person who bred fish. He said, Mark, you are like so weird. And I'm like, I am. And he's like, he's like, not in a bad way, but it's like, you actually love a fish that no one wants. And it's kind of cool because you never hear people talk about the true Percula. And uh, yeah, so that clownfish was my favorite. The maroon clownfish, which, you know, is just a different color. It's a completely different animal and much more mean and will be very aggressive and can actually tear up an anemone unless it's a really big one. And yesterday I was on, no, last night, two nights ago, I was on Facebook and someone posted up a thing in the saltwater group that said, you know, who, uh, who likes anemones? And he had his palm out with a little tiny thing barely the size of a golf ball cut in half, okay? So round, but <laughs> short. It was this little thing, and he had like 15 or 30 pictures of little anemones in his palm. And I was like, why are they so small? Because no self-respecting clownfish would tolerate that. They would literally destroy it because they would pummel it to death, and the thing would never have a chance to grow out. So, you know, when we were getting anemones 15 years ago, we get a large anemone, put in your tank, it was a showpiece, immediately the day you bought it. You didn't buy something tiny, wait for it to grow in for a long time. And I don't really understand why there are so many tiny ones. I, I don't know what's going on. I have a hard time believing that's all they find in the ocean. I have this feeling it's more like they are being chopped up and propagated, you know, to make more of, and they're selling them off while they're really, really small to maximize uh, earning potential. That's my guess. And the price of them is so high. So. Not a big fan of that. You know, when I've sold any anemones in the past, if it was my regular everyday, uh, the original one I got, which was a brown anemone, it started off green, but basically turned brown with white tips. And it's got a purple foot. I was selling those things for like 20 or 30 bucks a piece. You know, it was nothing. And uh, the Shermans at one point were considered a rare rose anemone. And so those always sold for 100 and I've always sold them for 100. I mean, it's just what I've done. But when I give someone one, it's big. It's not this little tiny dinky thing. <laughs> and if you're going to have clownfish and you have anemones, they need to be size appropriate so that both animals can live as they grow together harmoniously. Uh, the Clarky clownfish, I'm not going to talk about every clownfish. I'm just going to rattle off a few off the top of my head. The Clarky is kind of a bulldog clownfish and it is a biter. And so it's not one I would ever get myself. The lightning maroon is a beautiful clownfish, but it's the maroon clownfish family, and they're a little bit aggressive. So if you like them, it's possible you may have a 50-50 chance of it going well in your tank. I mean, they're really pretty. And they have been uh, bred and bred and bred, you know, into their gene line has been so diluted that they may be very much more uh, passive now compared to originally the first one. But man, that first one was stunning. I mean, the thing looked like it was Photoshopped. It was so crazy looking. Um, okay, so like I said, there's a lot of other, all, all the Ocellaris, most of them will be fine. And so you can enjoy pretty much any clownfish you like. I mean, if you ever see one you're really zoning in on, you're like, I want to get that, try to look up about that clown and learn more what you can about it. Try to find out their temperament, how they get along with other fish. And uh, typically it's best to get clowns in pairs. So that way they can be together and uh, you won't have a, a single fish by itself. All right. Um, a fish that I got with an aquarium that I purchased used was the Blue Atlantic Tang. And that one really belonged in a fish only system. It's a very aggressive fish and I wouldn't recommend it with others. But you know, it's so pretty. <laughs> it is such a beautiful fish. The juvenile is small, pretty. The larger one is pretty nice. And uh, while it's you know good looking, it would not be a good choice for a reef tank because it won't get along with its tank mates. It probably won't affect any of the corals in your tank, but it will beat up and thrash the other fish and just bully them into the corner and scare them to death. So I don't recommend that as a reef safe fish. A good one would be the blue green chromis. So chromis are awesome. But the only downside is they don't live very long and I don't know why, I, I don't think anyone knows why they don't seem to last long term. 
because having like 15 of those shoaling through your reef is so beautiful and they just are like just shimmering in the water column under the lights. But it seems like they just dwindle down and you'll suddenly have 13 and then you have 10 and then five and then two. So I don't know what's happening. I don't know what, if it's a hierarchy thing, I've never looked into it, but it's one to be aware of. And you know, they are inexpensive, but that doesn't mean they're disposable. So, but they are completely reef safe and you can definitely put them in the tank. They don't cause chaos. They are not aggressive at all, even though they are, um, well, like I said, I'm picking on themselves, but they're not going to go after the rest of your reef. The cleaner wrasse is one that I shared a couple of, uh, I think two years ago on this channel. And I bought one and I really didn't have high hopes for it surviving. And I explained how they don't do so well. You know, you may get lucky. And everyone replied, I've had one forever with no problem. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. Because I remember people would buy cleaner wrasse and they just didn't work out. And I got one on a, on a whim. And I was like, let's hope. And it's still swimming around my tank two years later. <laughs> it's like you guys said. And it is completely safe. It, it helps keep the fish clean. It's always looking for parasites. It will also go after pods. It may go after pests in the aquarium. It's a nice, good fish to have, and it's reef safe. Uh, keep in mind, and there's lots of wrasses, and some of them are good choices, and then some are not. And a lot of them are jumpers. So if you do keep a wrasse in your tank, it's best to have screens on top to keep the fish inside. Or if you can't do screens on top, if you have like a canopy system that's completely enclosed, if the fish jumps, it will go back into the water. Uh, it's sad for me when I see people put screen tops on their tank to protect the fish, and then they open you know, the thing or they walk up to the tank and there's the fish lying on top of the screen. Somewhere it found a gap, it jumped through it, and it's flip-flopping right you know, an inch above the water that would have kept it alive, and that's so sad. So uh, I remember one guy, he did something kind of unique around a really big reef tank, and he put like big chunks of rubber just hanging down like... Uh, like the mud flaps on a semi truck. And these rubber things were on all four sides. And he says, I don't care what fish jumps, it's gonna jump, it's gonna slide down the rubber and be right back in the tank. I was like, oh, that's pretty smart. And that way he didn't have to run the risk of it drying out on top of a screen because of an accidental jump or because it was spooked. So that's uh, if you're considering anything, if you are looking at screen tops, look at every single gap. No matter how small you think it is, Amazingly, these fish just see it and they go for it. So we want to keep those fish inside. Um, and since I talked about screen tops, I should also mention others will quickly say, well, then put a glass top or put you know acrylic top. Uh, the glass and or the acrylic will create a, uh, a negative in that it traps in the oxygen, oxygen exchange that your reef needs. Uh, we like to have fresh air getting into our tanks. We want the, the surface of the water rippling and the CO2 and the oxygen are, are commingling and, and uh, get letting off gassing and bringing in fresh air. It's a good thing. That's why we use screens and we don't cover our tanks up like you might with a fresh water. Uh, you know, back in the day when, in, when aquariums were being invented, they did put a top on there so you could stick a light on top and just set it on the glass. But that's not, you know, what we're doing with a reef tank. So we usually have them open. And look at all the tanks that are rimless, you know. <laughs> Hundreds and thousands of rimless tanks have been sold in the last 10 years instead of the kind I'm used to that have trim and a rim inside to actually set a screen in there. Um, the copper band butterfly, I'm just going to, like I said, I'm just, there's no particular order. I'm just going through this list. I don't think they're even alphabetical, even though it feels like it. But uh, eh, maybe it is. Maybe it's alphabetical. Um, the copper band is a really nice addition to the tank. It's very pretty. It's a butterfly. It will potentially eat aptasia in your tank it may go after a few other things but specifically it's looking for some meaty foods they're very thin fish they don't have a lot of meat on their bones and so they need to be fed regularly it's not the kind of fish you can put in a tank that you're feeding every two or three days if that's your your method this is not the fish for you but if you are feeding every single day and you're making sure that fish is getting fed you can have a really pretty one but Copper bands are really tricky in the regards of having a success story. And I, I do know, I had one years ago and it was perfect. And it came with that used tank with, um, it came with a different used tank. I bought the 280 used and it came with it and it was beautiful. And I had it for five years. And then uh, one day something bad happened in that tank and half my fish died, including that copper band. I was like, I'll never be able to replace that. 
And I did try a couple other times with other ones and they never lived. And so when I got the one that's behind me now, it's been a success story, but there were a few in between that didn't make it. And it made me actually feel guilty to keep buying them. I was like, well, clearly something's not working for me. So I'm going to stop buying these because I don't want to be that guy that keeps taking one more specimen from the ocean that can't be easily replaced. You know, I don't want to be the one that decimates a thousand to get one good one, you know? So I held off and then finally I came across one um, and uh, it was eating in the store. And so I went ahead and I brought it home and it didn't make it either. <laughs> I thought I had it all figured out. I had all the foods and everything. And I contacted the store and I said to him, I'm just asking, do you offer a, you know, seven or 14 day live guarantee? And they said, no, absolutely not. I was like, hey, I just want to ask because if I didn't ask and you did, <laughs> I'm missing out on an opportunity, right? And he said, no, but, you know, because it's you, Mark, we're going to give you another one. And I was like, well, you don't have to do that. And he's like, no, we need, you should just come by here and pick up another one. We'll get you one that eats. And I didn't. I didn't go back. I, I, it was a whole year later. I walked in that store as part of a club event. And the uh, store owner said, Mark, I've got a fish for you. <laughs> I was like, no, you don't. He goes, your name's been on my wall for the last year. You were getting your fish today. So that's the one that's in the tank now. And uh, she's doing she's doing good. I think it's a she. <laughs> it's doing well. Uh, now, when it comes to angels, there's a lot of different angels. Some are going to be reef safe and some are not. Uh, a couple that I, I, I know about four or five or six or seven that are reef safe. So I'll just rattle them off. The Potter's Angel, reef safe. Coral Beauty, reef safe. The Cherub Angel is reef safe. Um, the Bellis Angel, it grows really large. It's very silvery. That one is reef safe. Uh, the Interruptus, very expensive, reef safe. So those are all nice ones. Uh, not reef safe would be the peppermint angelfish, but since those are $25,000 each, I don't think you're getting one. Uh, the flame angel is kind of 50, 50. And, uh, the flame angel is another one of those tricky fish. I think they're really hard to catch in, in the wild. And I think, I hate to put this out there, but I feel like they're not being caught the correct way. And that's why we have such a hard time with getting a successful flame angel. But, if you can get a flame angel and it lives for two weeks, what's the rule? I think it's two days, two weeks, two months. If you can go get past those three thresholds, you'll have a healthy fish. I have bought a flame angel in the past that was completely normal, eating in the store, came home, put it in my tank. You know, it went through quarantine. I put it in my reef. And it was eating. I went to dinner and came home and it was dead. I'm like, how is that even possible? How could this fish have died? And it made me think something was wrong internally that I couldn't see. And, you know, like it was caught with cyanide would r kill its internal organs gradually. And we wouldn't know. And it could swim around, be eating while inside it's falling apart. And then we just lose our fish. So getting past the two day mark, the 14, you know, the two week mark. And then the two month mark were the three benchmarks for a success story. And you know, you got past two days, like, yes. Then you got past two weeks, you're like, okay. And then you're you're counting the days, you're putting X's on the calendar each day. Like, <laughs> two months, yes. And at that point, you've got your fish and that's good. But then there's a 50-50 chance that your flame angel won't be nipping at some corals in your tank. So also you have to ask yourself this when it, you know, even if fish if if a fish is reef safe. You have to ask yourself, it's chewing on coral A, but it's ignoring B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, you know, the rest of the alphabet, right? Does that make it a bad fish? Or is there just one coral you are not going to be able to keep in that tank with this fish so you can still enjoy the fish? So sometimes you have to also weigh the, you know, the situation and say, I really love this fish. I'm going to sacrifice getting that coral. Or I will set up a new tank for that coral and some other things I've always wanted. But I'm keeping this flame angel because other, other than that, it's a model citizen. It just really likes such and such. And if that is your situation, you know, because I've seen people that's like, 
they set up their tank, they get their zoanthids, you know, and they're buying like every brand of zoanthid out there. And I said brand, yes. And, you know, there's like massive collectors. And then they put in a flame angel because it's so pretty. And it's like nipping at all their zoas. And they're like, that's it. And they put it in the sump. They say sump it, which is a terrible place to put a fish. The fish does not deserve it. It didn't do anything wrong. It was just looking for things to snack on. And it might like your blue zoanthids. But uh, they said, it's going back to the store. or I'm going to give it to someone else. Like, that's fine. Let's put it in another home where it can be happy. But... If you uh, find that it's really not a big problem child and it's only picking up one thing, like for example, what if you had a, a full SPS reef and you discovered that it likes Montipora digitata, but it doesn't touch any of the Montipora capricornis, all the ones that look like the swirls. Um, it doesn't touch anything that's encrusting. It only goes after the branching ones. You're like, okay, so I just can't keep Montipora digitata in this tank with this fish. But there's so many other corals you can put in there. You can put in bird's nest, and you can put in acropora, and you can put in an acropora. And, you know, I mean, there's lots of other choices. So you can find a way to coexist with your reef tank and have your fish coexist with the livestock in your aquarium. Um, there are a lot of tangs that you can put in your reef that are considered reef safe. And there are some that are rather aggressive. The purple tang is semi-aggressive. The Sohal tang is very aggressive. The Atlantic blue tang is super aggressive. Um, but like the yellow tang, considered reef safe. Um, the coal tang, reef safe. A great working fish that will help nip it, nip and, uh, or gnaw it or kiss or whatever you want to call it. Gnawing on the rock, kissing the glass to get off film algae. Even gobbling up a little bit of sand you know, or something on the sand and then spitting it out. So it's constantly, it's a great worker fish. It's always doing something beneficial for the tank. I love that. I have a cold I've had for years now. I'm really glad that it's in my tank. Um, the hippo tang, very, very popular. It's beautiful. It's also called the regal tang. However, they are really rough on zoanthids. So if you're a big zoa nut, you probably do not want a hippo tang. But... If you have a hippo tank and some zoas and nothing's going on, good for you. <laughs> there are others out there that will have that exact situation, and their hippo tank is like moving the frag from here and dropping behind the rockwork. Or it will just... I had some what are called mean green zoanthids. It was probably the first named zoanthid back in the day because no one named any corals back then. And the person took the picture and says, I'm naming these mean greens. I'm like, okay, we'll just call them that from now on. And uh, I noticed one day they were like, so tight to the rock, it looked like I tattooed what a zoanthid might look like on rock. <laughs> it just it looked like etchings, you know. I was like, what is going on with these things? Why are they so like against the rock? And then I was watching the tank and I saw the blue hippo just chomp, chomp, chomp. And these these things pulled back. And when I removed the hippo tanks, I gave them to someone else with a much bigger tank. They all stretched out and fluffed up again. It was really interesting to see that change. You know, the animal was doing everything it could to stay alive, and the hippo tank was doing everything it could to eat it. So it, for me, that was not a, a great choice to have in my tank with zoanthids. They, I didn't, I really loved the mean greens, which by the way, I have not had in forever and would love to get some at some point. So if you see some online, tell me where I can find them. Um, but I do have a few zoanthids in my tank now, and I did have um, Dory in the anemone cube for a long time where there were none. And then I put her after all those years, and I had you know a few people give me a hard time saying, why would you put that poor fish in that tank full of those anemones? It's not fair to it. You need to take it out. And so Caitlin and I caught that fish out of the anemone cube, and we transferred it into the frag system. And within a month, it was dead. It lived for years. <laughs> Perfectly fine. Not a scar on its body. It dodged every tentacle. I don't know how it did it, but it was happy. It lived inside a Montipora colony that I let grow up the glass, and it slept in there and came out and ate and was active and pretty. And I got it when it was this big. And I think... I'm not certain, but I think that is... It's possible that my son won that in a club raffle. Because, you know, he was just like, hey, I want to buy some raffle tickets. I'm like, okay, go ahead. And uh, then he comes to me after the event is over and says, like, I want a fish. I'm like, oh my God, what? And it was this little tiny hippo tang. So I think it was that one. Maybe it was a different one because uh, that did happen. He did win one back in the day. But um, 
this one I had in the tank was very, very small and adorable inside that huge tank full of a few anemones and a bunch of clownfish. It was a really nice color dynamic. But, and I knew it wouldn't hurt any zoanthids because there's none in there. But uh, I eventually had to move it because I thought maybe it is time to give that fish more swimming room. And the frag tank is, you know, four feet long and it could just do this. And could not believe it didn't survive. That was crazy. Um, firefish are reef safe, but they're jumpers. So if you like the red firefish or if you like the... I think there's only two, right? The red firefish and the purple firefish, the hell freaky. Beautiful, beautiful, very timid fish, easily spooked. Uh, they do like to find some little spot down the rock work to hide in, and then they will come out to get food. Um, we had gotten three last year, and I have none. I don't know what happened to them. I never found them on the ground. Uh, maybe they were absorbed by a starfish or an anemone. I don't know, but I have none. That's kind of a bummer because they're so beautiful, but they're so delicate. I almost think they'd be better off in a very small, like an all-in-one tank that has the cover because they can't jump out. And uh, the biotope's so small, you tend to have just a little bit of rock work and there's more opportunity to see these absolutely lovely fish. Uh, very reef safe. They won't do any harm at all. The trick is keeping them in the water and not on the floor. There are lots and lots of gobies that you can put in your tank from little tiny ones, uh, the neon go uh, neon, yeah, neon goby that ORA breeds out, out of Florida. They're so small, they literally will go through the teeth of your overflow box and they will go down the drain and they'll hang out near the skimmer. <laughs> I've personally lived that, but there's all different kinds and there are so many to pick from and there's all different shapes and body sizes. The yellow clown goby or the citron goby is a pretty one, but can be a little aggressive to SPS corals. And what they tend to do is they will bite off all the polyps on a branch because they want to plant their eggs right there. And then they'll kind of live in the colony, but because they're in the colony so much, it irritates the coral, so it's kind of hurting it. So it, it's not perfectly ideal. I had one for a while and it was doing enough damage that I wanted to catch it. And so I had this crazy plan, uh, you know, because you know people say, how on earth do you catch a fish out of a big tank like this? Well, at the time, my tank was a 280-gallon aquarium. It was six feet long, 30 inches tall. Um, I think it was 30 inches wide, too. And this fish was living inside a colony of an acro, and it, was, it just kept biting polyps, and I was like, you got to go. So I grabbed a five-gallon bucket, and I got up on my steps tool because I didn't have a walk board on that tank, and I had a one-inch hose, you know, big orifice. And I put that hose in there and I started the suction like everyone does, just sucking on the hose and sticking the bucket. And I said, I've got about 90 seconds before this five gallon bucket overflows because it's one inch tubing. And I just put the hose right over the fish and shoot, it sucked it out. And I got it out in less than three gallons of water. I was so impressed with myself. I don't think I could have done that twice, but I was really <laughs> pleased that went well. I mean, obviously if I had to do that again, I would have a much bigger container so I have more time to keep going after this fish as it's trying to evade me. But I got really lucky on that one. I was able to do it without flooding my carpet. <laughs> so I was really happy about that. But uh, the green clown goby is less destructive and a very popular one, especially for nano tanks. So if you wanted to have some kind of a goby, the green clown goby would be a really nice one for your system. Very reef safe. Then there are the shrimp and goby pears where, for example, the, uh, the red-banded hyphen goby that lives with the uh, pistol shrimp, or you've got the yasha goby that lives with the pistol shrimp. Those are just beautiful fish that will, the shrimp will dig out a hole in the, in the gravel, in the uh, substrate. Did I say that right? The shrimp digs it out, and then the fish will go into the hole, and the fish will stick its head out. And the shrimp will be inside the hole and put out one antenna that touches the fish. And as long as the fish isn't moving, the shrimp feels safe. But if the fish twitches, the shrimp retracts or you know, retreats rapidly into the cave, into its den to be safe. And it's a really nice symbiotic relationship. Also good in a small tank. If I were to put it in this big tank, it'd probably be pointless. I wouldn't get to appreciate it. I have tried to put them in something smaller like the 60 gallon anemone cube because it's down on the bottom away from the anemones. I thought it would work out. Never saw them. So again, you want to have the smaller tank 
you know, it'd be kind of cool if, let's say you wanted to do something different and you set up a small tank with a light high above it and you put mangrove pods in there to grow mangrove plants and you had this pistol shrimp with this goby uh, as its mate. I mean, that would be cool. And you'd have all the roots coming down. You'd have the substrate. You'd see what's happening. You could put in some sexy shrimp and a few other things, but you could make a really nice little biotope with just a few creatures. And it, it would always look different every single day because they don't just make one hole and live there for the rest of their lives like I do in this house. They will keep relocating to new spots and it may be in the back for a while and then it moves to the side and then it's back in the front and really a cool reef safe creature or symbiotic pair to have. Um, I talked about angels before, but I didn't talk about all of them. I mean, there's a bunch and there are some really large ones. They would not be considered reef safe. Mostly we look at what are called dwarf angel fish when we're looking at choices. And then there's gonna be some that are more risky. I think the lemon peel is uh, kind of a 50-50 chance it'll work out with corals. You know, there's no absolute guarantee, but it's definitely one that uh, is very pretty. There is the, I think it's called the mimic yellow. Yeah, I don't, I don't know enough about it. But it looks like another fish, and it's 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 mimicking it, and I think that's the one where you can get away with it, <laughs> because it's not the actual one. I, I think I have that right. Uh, a lawnmower blenny is a fun one to have. Lots of personality, reef safe, doesn't do a lot of harm, but it can irritate some fish. I've had a couple of lawnmower blennies over the years, and the lawnmower blenny would decide Spock, this big whale of a fish looks like a nice wall of algae to graze on, and that lawnmower blending would dart upward and just bite Spock on the side and chomp, and Spock would turn so fast and want to kill that fish. It was hilarious, because uh, it only happened occasionally, but when it happened, she was like, oh no, you don't, and the blending's like, what? I didn't do anything, I saw nothing, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but I probably saw it happen three times, and yeah, Spock was not impressed. So, if you want to get that one, it is fun. You know, it's called the lawnmower blending. You'd think it'd be super helpful. It's really just nice to have. I would not say getting that fish will take care of your hair algae problem, for example, like some people might indicate. It may work on some of it, but I don't think it's going to devour it all and just clean the tank. It's not a gardener by any means, but it is a cool fish to have. Uh, one of the wrasses I've kept in the past that I liked was the lemon meringue wrass, which is a yellow wrass with a white belly. And they can grow to be pretty large, to be about six or seven inches long. And I like them, the smaller I can get them, the better. Because when they're small, that specific, the lemon meringue wrasse and the, and the banana wrasse, they will go into your corals and get the pests. I mean, right now my tank could use that exact fish because I'd like it to go through and look for any kind of acroporating flatworms. And uh, if uh, you let them get larger in your tank, if they stay with you for years, they will grow large enough to where they may start eating some snails. So not quite as reef safe as they were originally when they're juveniles. But as they get bigger, they're just hungrier and they're gonna go after whatever they can find. And if you're not feeding a plentiful amount of food, they may decide to go for that thing crawling across the glass. So you wanna watch out for that. The leopard wrasse is another one that's beautiful. It's got this fantastic markings on its body and would look great in any reef tank. Um, I tried one, it didn't have any luck and I didn't try twice, um, but I would like to try again. Maybe I should just go on a wrasse kick and buy a bunch of wrasses. Uh, the long-nosed hawkfish. Um, the long-nosed hawkfish, the... Uh, what is the other one called? The red hawk? Let me see if I have a picture of it because it'll have the name on it. Hmm. Nope, it's not on my list for some reason. Um, the long-nosed hawkfish I like a lot because it's a good worker for your tank in the regards that it will go after bristle worms that are in abundance. So if you have too many bristle worms in the system and they're just coming out of every nook and cranny, this fish will keep them under control. It won't eat them all, but it'll eat a lot of them. And it'll, it'll go after the big offenders that stick their heads out too far, which is really great. And they're really pretty. They perch on everything. They'll perch on your cleaning magnet. They'll perch on a power head. They'll perch on the rock. Um, if you put a fish trap, they'll go sit on top of the fish trap or in the fish trap. <laughs> they'll sit on anything. They don't have a swim bladder, so they don't just swim all the time, but they dart. They just, they move really quickly. And I had one that I got very small and it grew over the years. And then I put in a new fish 
Uh, I think it was one of the copper bands. And this hawkfish with no swim bladder was relentlessly hunting down the copper band to where I actually took the fish out and took it to the fish store and said, can you give this to someone else with a bigger tank? Because it's ridiculous how it's going to kill my copper band. And they're like, okay, no problem. And then I bought a new one that was really tiny and put it back in my tank. And I could not believe the difference, you know, because I'm so used to seeing this hawkfish in my tank. And it was so small. I kept thinking, oh my God, that thing was ginormous. To me, it was just normal size. But when you get your new juvenile and you put it in your reef tank and you're just, in, you just, it's remarkable the difference in size. You just, you don't really realize it. A lot of times you don't realize how large your fish are until you're holding them in your hand. That's when you get a really good sense of scale and you, you can realize how long something has been with you. Um... Other types of smaller fish that we often like to put in our tanks would be like the uh, magenta dotty back, the neon dotty back, the royal grama. These are all fish that like to live down low. They can be a little territorial in that they will find a spot they call home and they'll chase other fish away from it, but they're not destructive fish. They're not aggressively mean. They're not going to go chomp down on everything that you think is important. They just want to let everyone know this is my area and you are gonna have to respect my borders. And that, that makes sense. I mean, that's kind of the case with almost any fish you put in your aquarium. They all find a spot they call home and they work things out between themselves to what's ideal. But um, if you can get a few of a type of fish, you can see a really nice uh, dynamic in your tank. Like for example, when I was visiting Brad Ward, who was one of the first people I met in this local area in the hobby, he um, had a, a large tank that I think he propagated frags out of back then. This is like in the early 2000s. And he says, you want to see something really neat? <laughs> I was like, okay. And he reached into his freezer or he opened a jar of flake food or something. He put some food in the tank and there was a swarm of flame angels. It was amazing. I'd never seen so many flame angels in one tank at one time because I always see one and that's very normal. Normally people get one and put in their tank and that's it. And he had like five and not, not like five. He had five. Which, I mean, he could have had 50. That would have impressed me just as much as five did. And they were beautiful. And that red flying around just because they were like going around this rock work that looked like a volcano. And they're chasing down all the crumbs of food he put in the tank. It's like, these are amazing. Why do you have so many? And I think because he did aquarium maintenance, he might have got them for clients. Or maybe he just wanted to have five of his own. But it was a really neat effect. And when you can get large groups of fish, like I mentioned earlier, the chromis, or if you wanted to get a whole bunch of one clutch of clownfish. You know, if you can get yourself 20 or 50 of one set of clowns that all came from the same parent, from the same batch of eggs that are the same age, you can enjoy a really cool dynamic in your tank for a long time um, where they'll, they'll get along because they're just used to it. But if you try to put two of this and two of that and two of the other, that doesn't work out long term. And a lot of people keep trying to do that. And there's going to be a few people that have managed to make it work, but the majority cannot, and including the nice people at BRS. They, their clown tank, their harem tank did not work out as everyone had hoped. It sounded great in theory. It looked really neat. But most of them were removed from that tank because the fighting never stopped, and they were saving these fish, getting them out of the tank before they were murdered by their uh, tank mates. So if you're wanting to do a large group of clowns, you want to find a breeder and you want to get like six month old babies from that breeder, they're maybe an inch long, three quarters of an inch long, and get a, grump, a, 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 a group of them, you know, a grump of them, a group of them. I think that that would be really cool. And that's what I did with my anemone cube. And uh, I still have 12. And those guys are in the small temporary tank right now waiting for me to build a new stand. There are probably five or six different antheas on the market that we usually get. My pref my personal preference I've always liked um, that are easy to keep. I say easy. Yeah, I mean, okay. easy enough are the liar tail antheas. I think they're beautiful. They have the purple eyeliner. They remind me of Cleopatra. <laughs> and I just think they're just wonderful fish. And I have, in my tank, I have two females and one male. There's a female and there's another female. The male is probably on the back side right now. Um, whenever you get antheas, you want to get them in groups of, in odd numbers. So three, five, seven. 
and you want to have, if you can, you can get seven girls. One girl will turn into a boy, and then you'll have your male. So you don't have to literally go out and find a male and then get some females. But if you're in a shop and you're shopping, and you say, I want the purple one because that's the boy, and then you get some of these orange ones, you can you know, get a group, but you want to get an odd number. You don't want to just get one of each. Okay, That's the, the one thing you do not want to do. Uh, one of the antis I've always wanted that are expensive and uh, just more, you don't see them as often. You, you really barely see them. They're called ventralis, and they have these stunning markings. And if you were to Google what they look like, you know, there's a few pictures on the web, and you're like, yeah, I can see why Mark likes that fish. <laughs> it's so pretty. And it's one of the ones I was thinking about maybe adding to this tank. And I did put word out to Eric Cohen over in California because he started a new company with you know fish collecting and selling. I said, if you can find me some Ventralis, I might be in the market if it's affordable enough. So we'll see what kind of prices he comes with and if he can get me any. But uh, he, uh, he got some for... Um, <clears throat> trying to remember his name andrew over on in new york he got him a bunch and delivered them personally <laughs> talk about concierge service right and i was like those are my ventralis what are you doing giving those to andrew andrew sandler so um i would like to get some at some point someday um fox face fish there are two kinds on the market typically i think there's the yellow one that has the black markings and then there's the magnificent fox face which I think is beautiful. And uh, if I were to get one, I would get the Magnificent just because it looks so much better to me than the yellow one. Um, they are both good at eating algae, so that's useful. They're a herbivore in that area. Um, that downside is that their spines are uh, poisonous. And if you get stabbed, it's gonna hurt. It's gonna be like getting stung by a bee. And they're not mean fish. They're not looking to attack you if you were to reach in your tank. But if you're cleaning and you accidentally hit its spine, which can happen, you might be just cleaning the back of the glass and you like tunk. You're like, oh, it's like, you know, you're cleaning the glass and you hit an urchin. Same principle, right? The, the quill just got you. So hurts a lot. Um, it's the one reason I've never had a fox face, just because I don't want to get stung by anything in my tank. But um, they are nice. They are reef safe. They are interesting. They can change their look a little bit based on mood. Um, they can perch, they can swim. I mean, they're, and they get along with their other fish friends. So that's a nice choice. You know, I mentioned a few tangs. I didn't even mention the Nassau tang. Spock. So uh, the Nassau tang comes from Hawaii. Doesn't mean you can't find one somewhere, but Hawaii is closed. So I'm not really sure about their availability. But... Um, there are two kinds of Nasso. Mine is the Literatus. Thanks to Jason for putting that on the artwork he sent me <laughs> because I always had the wrong name. Um, there is the... I'm having a hard time today remembering all the details because I came into this with like all these aspirations and then the Lacey Act threw off everything in my brain. Um... I'm just having a, 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 a brain freeze. I can't think of anything right now. Sorry. I just can't do it. I'm trying to think. Blonde Nasso, and then there is the the other one. <laughs> so I always thought Spock was a blonde. And that's what I think I was told when it was given to me, and it turns out I was wrong. So it is the Nasso Literatus. Mandarins, my favorite fish in the world. <laughs> I love mandarins, and there are um, two kinds that you can get. There is the green spotted mandarin, and then there is the psychedelic mandarin. And uh, the actually, you know, it's funny. I might have this incorrect on my list here. The green spot, I think, is the one. Eh, let me check something here. And I might have it wrong on my website. Um, so the the larger ones that are blue or green, those are my favorites, and that's the ones I've always called psychedelic mandarins. But I think psychedelic is actually uh, assigned to 
the target mandarin fish, which makes no sense to me because the larger ones look way more psychedelic <laughs> than the ones with spots. You know, I target mandarin fish makes sense to me because there's like targets on its body and they are smaller and uh, they're interesting, but the larger ones are so much more beautiful and they can be blue, green, red. Uh, the green ones tend to be green. I did accidentally somehow manage to get an orange one. It's the craziest thing ever. It's on my critter ID of my website and I loved it. I had it for many, many years and it was fat and sassy. And then one day it was dead. And I mean, when you looked at it on the bottom of the tank, dead, it was just so round. It looked like the seams were about to split. It was such a well-fed mandarin. And I really enjoyed it, but it did not get along with the green one. And so because the tank was huge, they kind of didn't squabble much. But initially, they were doing this thing where I thought they were mating. <laughs> I was, I shared a video, I think, or, or like a ton of pictures maybe, and a few people said, no, I don't think that's mating. I think that's fighting. I think you've got a couple of boys or you have a couple of girls. And I was like, no, because, you know, one did not look like the other. And uh, so this happened for a while. But eventually they kind of, no one died, which was lucky. But years later, it just was dead one day. It just, I don't even know what happened. Uh, but mandarins are beautiful. They're sand dwellers. But they will swim up during the dusk lighting period to do their mating dance if if you have a pair. And they're very reef safe. The only trick is making sure they're well fed. Now biota grows them from eggs. <laughs> so they've trained them to eat aquarium food right there at their facility. So if you're buying biota mandarins and you're gonna get really small ones, you have a huge chance of success versus the ones we used to get from the ocean that was you know so much harder to wean them off of ocean food and get them convinced to eat uh, prepared foods. And a lot of us were growing our own brine shrimp and rotifers and, and buying pods from Reef Nutrition and pouring those in the tank to try and provide enough food and sustenance to keep the mandarin alive long term. But I think the biota ones make life so much easier now by, in comparison. So um, if you are thinking about getting a mandarin these days, either the Target or the Psychedelic are both beautiful additions to your tank. Now the difference between a male and a female, the male has a big spike on its back. Just a, like a like a spike. <laughs> it's just a, it's a it's a it's like one of its spines is super long, and then the other one does not have it. So the male has the big spike. The female has like a little curved fin on the top. So that way you can tell when you're buying if you're shopping and you're in a store and there's you know ten mandarins in a tank and you're wanting to get a boy and a girl. You want to find one with a spike and one with a curved fin. Keep in mind because males fight with other males. If that tank has ten mandarins in it there's a chance a couple of males already fought and one broke the spine off and you may not readily realize that's a boy that hasn't regrown its spine so or spike or whatever you want to call it. So you want to you know really study the fish before you say that's the one to make sure you're getting a good pairing. Otherwise, you're going to put two males in your tank and you're going to see fighting. Uh, one fish I didn't talk about, again, in the tangs group, was the powder blue tang. There's the powder brown, powder blue. Um, I mean, there's so many tangs, right? But the powder blue is very popular, and it's one I, I would kind of consider getting. I think it would be really pretty in this tank. And the problem with the powder blue is they are just well known to be ick magnets. And the one that came with my 280 um, was beautiful, but then one day, which just covered an ick. And I look at every other fish in the tank, and there's no ick. And I'm just like, oh my god, this poor fish, I'm going to have to figure out a way to catch it. It's a huge tank. I've got to put it in a hospital tank. I've got to figure out how to do all the medicine. And the next day I'm looking at it, and it's completely fine. Oh, like, what is going on? And then, you know, like, two weeks later, poof, just covered in ick. And then, you know, two days later, completely fine. I was like, you know what? I'm not touching that fish. <laughs> I'm going to leave it alone. It seems to know what it's doing, and... It never, I didn't have it, like, I didn't see ick on other fish. I didn't see anything. It was a very, very weird situation. I left it alone. I had it for many years. It also was one of the ones that died during my incident when I lost the uh, copper band. I lost several beautiful fish that one night, and uh, the, the powder blue was a very plump, healthy fish. And I was really sad to lose it because it had a lot of um, personality, and it, it didn't, I didn't think it was doing any harm to my reef. 
Turns out I was really, really wrong because I had this large toadstool leather I'd grown from a frag the size of, I don't know, my pinky. And it grew into this nice toadstool, but it was always smooth. And occasionally you'd see a couple little tentacles try to come out or polyps try to emit out of it. But the powder blue would just gnaw them off. And so it was always smooth. And when the powder blue died and I lost it, the toadstool transformed into this beautiful coral. And all these polyps came out. And it literally looked like a field of, of hay. Just, is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it would just be swaying in the current. It was just beautiful. And I was like, man, I had no idea. I mean, it, yeah, it sucks to have lost that fish. But the perk of it not being in my tank was massive. Completely different look of the, the coral. And that coral grew into be something the size of a 33-gallon trash can. Because when we took it out when the tank leaked, it filled the trash can wall to wall. It was insane how large that was. So um, I really did enjoy it. I just want you to know that if you were to get one, it could break out a nake all over its body. It could be something you're going to deal with medically, or you may be able to do what I did and just kind of leave it be. It just depends on the circumstances. I mean, obviously, if, if the sickness that you would see from ick is persistent and the fish is lethargic and it's not eating and it, it's rubbing against rocks and stuff, that's something you have to deal with. Mine just looked like it was covered in snow, and then two days later, it looked perfect, like you know something out of a out of a science book. You know, you're like, wow, what's going on? How does it do that? And how does it not look sick? And how is it just emitting it one time and then not at all? It's very very odd. But I really did enjoy that fish. And then finally, I got something a couple of years, well, a few years ago, five years ago called the red spot cardinal fish. And there are different cardinals, by the way. We can talk about that as well. But the red spots, they're really interesting. They're kind of a freshwater fish in look. And I got some, and it made me laugh, because like, look, Mark got freshwater fish. But they didn't last, and I don't know why. I, I really don't know. They just, I got five or six, and then I had none. So that was one I'd, I might look into again. Like if I did a small biotope, like I said, with the mangroves and with the pistol shrimp, goby pear, maybe put these little red spot cardinal fish in there. That would be a really interesting biotope. It would be really fun to watch. Um, Bengai's very popular, reef safe, um, can even breed in your tank. Um, pajama cardinals are another nice one, reef safe, don't do any damage, and uh, just grow to become ginormous like mine. <laughs> And what else do we have that I haven't that wasn't on my list? You know, I, I didn't even talk about the skunk clownfish. I've had these skunks so long, I'm confused of their age. Um, I saw a Facebook memory that was dated 2012 with me with skunks. And I was like, these are 10 years old? Really? But then when I went to my YouTube video to see the video where I sent them down the tube into the anemone, it's like today or tomorrow or something like that would be exactly when it happened. And that one was in 20... 15, I think it was. Six years ago. So they're definitely at least six years old, but I don't know why my Facebook showed them being older because I've never had skunks before then. But I still have all 11 six years later, which is really, really cool. So those are the ones that I wanted to talk about today. Obviously, we are here to talk with you. So if you have other fish that you think should be included in this conversation, I welcome that in the chat. Also, if you have questions for me, I'm going to sit down now. If you have questions for me, you can uh, just do an at Mila's Reef, and then I will see your questions and I'll answer you. Let me scroll to the top of this chat to when you guys all started talking to me a whole hour ago, and I didn't say anything because I was trying to stay on topic. Some people can do a live chat and a live stream, and I can't. Let's see. Okay, we'll start with this one. <clears throat> Reef the Sea Forever says, let's talk about how angel peel angels, I think you mean lemon peel angels, get a bad rap as a coral eater. I own one and it doesn't eat any corals. It eats algae. Small, stupid hermit crabs, <laughs> and it's very nice. It's almost like having a small yellow tang. Um, you know, <clears throat> the lemon peel, I think, is one of those ones that's kind of an iffy fish. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for a reef tank. 
but there's a chance it could work out like it did for you. So thanks for chiming in on that. Hey, Jack. She has been super needy today. You can't see her. She's right here. There's her nose. Say hi to everyone, Jack. <laughs> I'm going to let her outside. Even my coffee got cold. Uh, Brad says, can we get an Acroidium flatworm update? Yes. So the Drew's Acro that I took out of the tank <clears throat> and dipped and scraped off every egg and put back in the tank, I took out both pieces and I put them in a bowl of tank water and a turkey baster and I blew them off a lot from every angle and one little tiny flatworm came off. So I think I eradicated them off of that coral. <laughs> However, a couple other corals in the tank look a little pale, making me nervous. So I think I'm gonna do a power head on an extension cord and start working my way across the reef and see if I can blow more off. I think the cleaner wrasse is eating them and I know the antheas will too if they're in the water column. So hopefully, I mean, I would wish I could blow them off and catch them in a net. So they can't just land somewhere else, you know, if a fish doesn't gobble it up. But uh, this is going to be this thing where for the next few weeks or months, I'll probably just take in a power head and blowing off the corals to knock these things off of the skeleton so that they can't eat them. And hopefully other things in the tank will be predators of them and take care of the problem. And I definitely will remember to put all those links about the Lacey Act in this video's description. Um, just at Chico? <laughs> just a Chico? That's it. Just a Chico. Got it. Says, are they breeding coal tangs the same way they're doing yellow tangs? And I know some angels are being bred as well. There are some fish that are being bred, but the Lacey Act doesn't mean that captive raised or captive bred fish won't be considered um, injurious. That's the scary part of this. It's so vague, they can get away with anything. That's the problem. And to get something added to the whitelist, that is the other problem. Because apparently it's really hard to get something on there because it has to be proven this is safe. And so it's not like, oh, well, here's a list of 29 fish we trust. That's not going to happen either. That's not how the government works. Uh, Alex says, what do you think about using multiple carbon blocks instead of RODI to make salt water? I saw Jake from Reef Builders is doing that. It depends on the source water where you are, whether you're on well water, city water, um, have your own uh, spring nearby. But the thing is, is like if the TDS is super low and everything measures clean, then yeah, you could probably just polish it a little bit with some carbon. But most of us, we don't have that flexibility. We have a lot of stuff in the water that is provided by the municipal water supply. And people in a well have all kinds of things they have to filter out, and carbon's not going to be enough. Uh, there was a friend of mine, he was in Atlanta, and I think his TDS coming out of the faucet was something ridiculous like three or six. So he literally just pushed water through a DI, and that was it. I see some people talking about lionfish. Um, there are lots of lionfish in the Gulf of Texas now. Okay. I wasn't aware of that. Uh, I think Jack wants to come back in. Sorry. This is a live stream. Things are happening. Oh, it's cold out there. Her fur is freezing cold. I told you guys it wasn't going to get to 57. No way. It's 45. Um, and then somebody says, don't people eat lionfish? Yes, but not enough people eat lionfish. That's the problem. And lionfish are so prolific in laying eggs. It's some, I forget, 
I'm just not 100% sure I have this correct, but I think I read, you know, like one lays 200,000 eggs. And, you know, whatever, as they get, as they grow, they eat anything that fits their mouth. And they're just causing so much destruction to the smaller fish, to that small population um, in Florida. And they're spreading to other places too. So it's a real, real problem. And if they're in the Gulf, they're doing the same thing here. So um, that would be an injurious fish. And, you know, that would be one of those ones, like if you had it and you wanted to move across state lines, you technically would not be legally able to do so. Uh, somebody said, Gregory says, the Lacey Act is fine. Stop worrying, children. Well, it is fine right now because it hasn't been changed. <laughs> if it gets changed, that'll affect everything. And uh, Jamie says, I don't understand why everyone is worrying about something that's not at all true. Nowhere does it say it'll affect the aquarium industry, nor will it. I'm sorry, but that's not true. That I know for a fact. And when I put the links in, you can verify for yourself. Uh, reef the Sea Forever says there's really not a reef safe fish because fish like to do crazy things. My yellow tailed damsels rearrange his house and move corals around. You know, um, the thing is, we read about these fish, we do our research, and then we find out that the fish don't read the same articles we do. <laughs> and they just do what they want. Doesn't that sound a lot like humans? But yeah, it's funny. So yeah, Gary, some dwarf angels are going to be okay if you want to keep SPS corals. Look at this love for the trooper Kula. Jason says it's stunning. He loves his. Andrea says probably my favorite fish of all my clowns. Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind getting my hands on some new trooper Kulas. Before Lacey changes their mind. You know, I don't get very political with you guys, but this one here is one of those ones where if we do nothing and they just come in and take it all away, and why didn't you tell us? What could we have done? You know, it's that's the whole thing. We need to. Uh, one thing that um, that Rich said last night, which I thought was really good, and I, I'm sure he said it before, and it just resonated with me. He says we need to quit being so reactive and be more proactive. And I agree. I think that we usually are reacting, and we're always on the defense when it comes to this stuff. And we need to be more proactive. We need to be more uh, transparent. We need to be better organized, like some of these other groups are. I mean, <laughs> you think about the activists that are out there. They are very organized. They are doing everything they can to stop others from doing the things they like, right? I mean, that's what they do. And Or they're, they're anti, you know, some business that's destroying wildlife. Or they're anti, you know, pollution. I, I understand. I'm not saying all activist groups are bad. But my point is, is like they're organized. They get very organized. And we as a group, we don't like check in with each other and run a newsletter that tells each other all the latest and make sure we're all saying the same thing on, on a regular basis. We don't do that. We just basically have a box with some salt water in it and some fish and corals. And we kind of walk around with our heads down <laughs> when you think about it. We're not staying in tune with what's happening around us. And I think that's going to be a problem. Uh, Insane Reefer says, any recommendations where I can get good quarantine fish online? I'd normally get mine from Live Aquaria, but I've been hearing bad reviews lately. Live Aquaria's Diver's Den is the quarantined fish. So if you're looking for that, that's one. Um, Biota would be another one that I might consider is probably quarantined when you think about it. I mean, they're captive bred raised. ORA's stuff is going to be pristine. I mean, they're so strict with their facilities. You know, you can go in and tour 
and they'll say, you cannot walk in here at all. You can look through the doorway at what's happening and you can't see anything because there's too much stuff in the way. Uh, when we were walking through uh, a bunch of these giant troughs filled with salt water, there was something floating and me being a hobbyist, I'm like, oh, something fell in here. I was just going to lift it out and put it on the edge. And he said, don't put your hand in there. And I was really embarrassed that I got caught. And I was like, I'm sorry, that plastic thing goes, don't, no, none of your hands go in this water. And I was like, wow. And that was their biosecurity. They're very aware of it. Reef nutrition that grows the phytoplankton, the copepods, all that. They have like clean rooms where they do everything. So nothing cross contaminates, you know, not even anything off my hand trying to be helpful to remove something from a container. I mean, you know, I had, I should have said, may I remove that? Or did you notice that? But instead I was just being helpful. And sometimes that's not the right thing to do. So we want to make sure that um, if we're somewhere, we ask permission. That's just a quick little PSA to keep yourself from getting in trouble with the guys at ORA if you ever visit. But um, yeah, who else does quarantine? I don't know. Some fish stores will do quarantine. This uh, store by me, Frank's Tanks, his whole fish section, um, as far as I know, he continues to medicate the entire section. Every tank there is the same medicine so that these fish come out, hopefully, uh, disease-free. Uh, so that may help other places. Things just come in, you take a chance, and that's why you would put it in a quarantine tank and observe it. And then if it's sick, medicate it. Um, it's, it's hard. <laughs> Fish are hard. Corals are easier. Yeah, there you go. Um, Reefing C says, I cannot bring myself to cover my rimless tank because it defeats the look. I agree. Now, there are some screens that fit inside the rimless, a little tiny clip, so it kind of is like an eye line. You wouldn't see it. But if you walk up, you'll see the screen on the top. Um, I think that's kind of a nice middle ground. But put, to put something on top that sits on top that looks like it's there is so unpleasant. So it's almost better to have a canopy around the top that, again, things could bounce up, you know, jump up and then ricochet and come back down into the water would be smarter. I mean, it's another option. Plus the benefit is you don't have the lights shining into your eyes and flooding the room with light. The new 60 gallon that's going up is gonna have a stand and a canopy. And it's, so I no longer get the light from the radion hitting the rest of this room. It's gonna be really nice to contain the light that I've been dealing with for so long over there for over eight years. Uh, Alex says, is it possible to keep an emperor angelfish in a reef tank? I don't remember. Sorry. There's a, a couple of really pretty angels that I've seen in some SPS tanks that I thought would never work. But the person, like I was visiting this one person, I think we were in North Dakota, North or South Dakota, one of the Dakotas. And he hung in there a little thing that kind of looked like a film case, you know, like how 35 millimeter film used to come in a case, but it had a lot of holes in it. And it hung down off a fishing line. And he filled up with food and his butterfly and his angel just keep hammering away at that to knock food out of the tiny holes. And he, cause he kept always putting food in there. The fish were not doing any damage at all to his SPS reef. And I thought, wow, that was a really nice solution to get the best of both worlds. But I can guarantee you, even though he has food in a container, if that fish swims past a coral that looks like it has a nice snack, it might still take a nip here and there. It does happen. Oh, <laughs> Reef Keeper said, my flame angel loves my space invader, Pectinia. I was about to give up on that coral being in my reef. I moved it to the clownfish territory and they chase off the flame angel. Problem solved, LOL. I love that. That's a good one. <laughs> oh, your comments. Paul says, my hippo was fine until it got to six inches and then stripped my zoas. Now he's looking for Nemo. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, how neat is that? Yeah, I think you're going to be the first person I know that's had one. 
Aquapuncture says, I have a rescued Orbic batfish. Definitely not reef safe, but a wonderful personable fish. Yeah, I don't know anyone has a batfish. So you'd be the first. I've seen them in public aquariums. I'm looking at all the comments are like, I'm never going to do this again. I'm never going to get such and such again. There you go. Swallowtail angelfish are reef safe. Yeah, the swallowtail is different than the other one I mentioned earlier. And they are really pretty. I agree. That would be a nice one to have. Flamehawk, thank you. <laughs> Someone answered that question. I was trying to remember the name of the other hawk. So there is a hawkfish out there that you may come across at the store called the Arc Eye Hawk. And it has like a an arc over its eye. And so it's called the Arc. Yeah, Arc Eye Hawk. Um, that one there will eat your cleanup crew. So you don't want that one. But the flame hawk is definitely fine to have. It's pretty. Uh, it also perches. It, it will swim, but it likes to perch a lot, just like the uh, long-nosed hawkfish. But the the flame hawk, it, you know, it's red. It's beautiful. It's stunning. Brendan says, I love my pair of long-nosed hawkfish. Mine eat like koi, where they splash and make lip-smacking noises. Oh, and they, sh they uh, love... They love to rest on the Nero 3 core just to show off. Yeah, I mean, the, those long-nosed hawkfish will perch on anything. I was trying to remember, a few days ago, I was in front of this core. I was just standing here. And there was a fish in front of it. I'm trying to remember which one it was. But um, it might have been the copper band. And I could hear it eating like the tiny crunching sound of biting. I was like, wow, I've never noticed that before. I mean, that tells you how quiet your, your room is and how quiet your reef is when you can hear a fish eat through the glass. You know, it's one thing to hear them at the top or whatever, or you put in something crunchy. But I mean, I'm putting in frozen food that's been thawed out. So everything's chewing, but it, it's like eating pasta, right? I mean, it's relatively quiet stuff. You know, it's not like they're breaking open walnuts and underwater or something where you'd expect to hear it. And I was like, I can actually hear this fish like, and I was watching and I could see the mouth move with the sound I was hearing. And I was like, that's insane. Funny how you come across things that you've never noticed in the past in something you've had for so long. <laughs> I've had this tank for so long, had that fish for so long, never caught that. Um, Dennis asked about the Moorish Idol. We recently bought one from a friend. It's eating and it doesn't touch any corals. It's currently in quarantine before going to the 400. Um, Moorish idols are just hard to keep alive. Um, and so there's another one that's similar that uh, people tend to get because they have a better success rate. There's um, also a flagfish out there as well that people like to get. All three of those do work in a reef tank. It's just the Moorish Idol is a little harder to keep. I've personally never tried one because I, I, I thought it might be too challenging. Let me, uh, I want to look this up really quick. Because I want to remember the name of the other one. Moorish Idol. Like I said, I'm just having the worst time today. I think Heniochus is the other one. Yeah, Heniochus is the other one that looks like a Moorish idol, but it's easier to keep. Has a different, the markings on its body are different toward the tail section. So if you're looking, you'll, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to just say, 
you'll know a Moorish idol when you see one, because that's not really true. But if you Google it and you find out what a Moorish idol looks like and you're at a store, it's either it is one or it isn't. So if you see one and you think it's a Moorish idol, but it doesn't match like some really good representation pictures on Google, then it's probably the Heniocus. And that one would be the one that you could get for your tank and it would work. Um, they're also called banner fish, like I was saying, or pendant fish. And uh, it's just their stripe is different toward the tail. The Moorish idol is, uh, it's got the black and white and yellow, but the, the colors, like, they go straight down and there's like breaks. So, like, the tail is black, there's the black band, but there's like a yellow divider between it. Where with the Heniocus, they're going at a slight angle and the color kind of blends into the, it's just different. It's very different. So you can look at the two, and once you know the two are separate, you can be able to shop more easily for uh, the correct fish you want to have. But both really nice fish. Good luck with that Moorish Idol. I hope it does well in your 400. I want updates. Alfredo says he has a group of 10 Bang guys and they're they're killing each other off. That is unusual. I have not heard that at all. Um, the, the thing is, usually they will breed in the tank and you have all these babies and people will discover one in their sump or they'll discover one in the overflow box. I mean, I have a couple of Bang guys in my anemone cube, or did, and I kept thinking, am I going to find a baby someday? I haven't yet, but it'd be really cool to happen. And who knows, when I break down the little temporary tank, what if some babies show up? I have no idea. Someday I'm going to come across some because they're mouth breeders or brooders. And so they will spit them out when they're ready. But normally you need to have a spot for them. And I know quite a few people that have actually raised them in their homes. And it was really cool. They'd make a little fake urchin out of some putty and some zip ties or putty and some toothpicks to make a fake urchin. And they put that in their little uh, separate tank for the babies. And the babies all live inside the spikes of the fake urchin because that's what they consider safe and uh they keep feeding them regularly until they get bigger to where they can be put back in the reef this coffee is so cold Ugh. thank you reef keeper nasso elegans is the blonde yeah i do not have the blonde i was wrong the difference between the blonde and mine is the blonde has the yellow on, on the top of the head and mine does not. And for a long time, I kept saying it's a blonde and it was Lori who told me, you are you don't have the right fish. And I Google it. I say, right there. And she says, look at Google. And I'm like, I did. And I take screenshots. And she says, that proves that Google's not always right. <laughs> and I was like, wow, you're right. Because then I started looking and there was a lot of mis, uh, misidentification that had become the top of the search results. So it just proves even when we find something that seems to be correct, we need to double check and make sure it's right. So that's when I learned years ago, mine's not a blonde Nasso. It's just a regular Nasso. Because Lori had a blonde and that was the difference. Hers had the yellow on the top of the head. Yeah. Marcus says, yes, the spotted is the psychedelic. It makes no sense. Yeah, it's weird. I disagree with that description. I feel like we should fix that. So the, we're t I'm sorry, I, I know, in case you're just like, he's just randomly spitting out words. The target Mandarin is the one that's considered the psychedelic Mandarin, which makes no sense. The big, beautiful blue one with all the spirals and stuff all over its body, not psychedelic at all. I really disagree. I don't know what happened with that naming, but... Uh, I think they messed that one up. Uh, Emmanuel says, I have to quarantine for 45 days, six SPS corals. Would I need to dose the tank or should they be fine with water changes? Man, I don't know. That's a long time to keep SPS happy in a temporary tank. Um, Good lighting, good flow, water stability, top off, dosing. Yeah, probably need a dose. Just depends how tiny they are and how well they're holding up. But uh, just to put them in there and hope it'll work good enough with water changes might be overly ambitious. It just depends. It's a long time. I mean, that's six, seven weeks. 
Travis says, what, are your, what is your opinion on bristle worms in the reef tank? They're multiplying like crazy. I don't have anything to eat them. Any suggestions, recommendations to keep them in check? Yes, the long-nosed hawkfish was one fish I mentioned that helps eat them. Also, the arrow crab is another one that is a predator of bristle worms. They won't eat them all, but they'll eat all the ones that stick their heads out. So you'll still have some, which is fine. They're not bad for the tank. It's just bad when you have 10 million of them. When there's too many, we want to reduce their population down to a smaller, correct amount to keep up with clean detritus out of the sand bed and the rock work. But we don't want to have, and you know, also if something dies in your tank, like a fish, the bristle worms will co-consume it. Same with a clam or anything else that dies in your tank. They are part of the things that destroy and remove so there's no more evidence of something that existed in your tank. Speaking of crazy things that just disappear in your tank, I, uh, years ago, went on a trip. I think I was gone for, it was probably for Macna. I think I was gone five days. And at that time, I was renting out a room to a friend, and his job was just feed the fish and top off and, you know, kind of let me know if there's anything going on. And I just picked up a little tiny adorable lionfish at the fish store. I just couldn't help myself. It was so small, I knew it couldn't eat my fish. And so I put it inside my aquarium. And the aquarium at, the, at, the, at that time was a 29 gallon. So I had, you know, clownfish in there, a blue damsel. Um, I might have had a flame angel at that time. And this tiny lionfish. Not a Fu Manchu, like a little one. I mean, like a regular lionfish, a baby. Just a tiny one with huge flaring fins is beautiful and i said you know i got this food for the lionfish make sure you give it a meal at least once every couple of days and uh you know don't stick your hand in the tank unless you absolutely have to you know i explained the dangers and he's like okay and then i came back from my trip and there was no lionfish and i was like where's my lionfish he goes i don't know i can't find it it's weird right <laughs> i was like yes it's weird i was like what's wrong with it what'd you do to my lionfish he's like no i'm serious i don't know where it is I went, I mean, it's a 29 gallon. I think those are 30 inches by 12 inches. It is not big. And I went over that thing with a fine tooth comb and could not find one trace, not one quill of that lionfish anywhere in the tank. The, the bristle worms, you know, the other stuff in my cleanup crew, they must have devoured it. I don't even know how it died, why it died. It just was gone like it never happened. It was very, very strange. So yes, bristle worms are very effective in taking care of decaying matter in a tank. And they're not a bad thing to have but we don't want to have a million. And what happened was one day, uh, someone was visiting, some, some, uh, some young lady, and I was putting flake food in to feed the fish, and she just, her eyes were drawn to all the bristle worms coming out of every nook and cranny of the rock work. I never noticed them. You know, I see my fish, I see my corals, and I saw rock, and she was like, oh my God, what is all that? And I was like, what? And she's like, there's worms everywhere. And it was from her eyes that I saw, man, there was a lot of bristle worms in that tank. And when I put the food in, they all showed their heads and it was just like wriggling everywhere. I was like, oh, there really is too many, you know? She was right. And that was when I added the arrow crab and, and long nose hawkfish. And then, you know, I could, <laughs> if I could have ever got her to come back, <laughs> she would have been able to look at a reef tank and have me put flake food in and not get the willies. Uh, so that would have been uh, a funny follow-up. But anyway, problem was solved. And uh, she never came back. I can't remember why she was even here. But it was a funny reaction that I never even noticed. And the tank is mine. You'd think I'd notice this stuff. It's funny. Paul says, can you recommend food for the critters at the bottom of the tank? Sinking pellets is one method. Um, I have a little video on this channel of feeding mandarins using something called the Mandarin Diner where I took an olive jar and I put an acrylic handle on it so I could put it in the tank because my tank was so big. And I put the food in there, whether it was frozen food thawed out or it was egg row, R-O-E, or it was pellet food. And I would just put the thing all the way down on the sand where the opening as even with the sand as possible so that the fish gliding along could just glide right in, get their food and glide out. And that worked really, really well for those uh, creatures down at the bottom that need food. You can also use a very long type of um, uh, turkey baster. I think New Life Spectrum makes one where the tube is very, very long, a little white plunger at the top, or bulb at the top, 
and you can squirt food down low in the tank if you need to. And of course, feeding the, the fish in the water column is a really good thing to kind of get them all filled up. So when you want to put food down low for sun corals or things down there, they will be less likely to steal it away. So that may work. But uh, that's kind of what I would do. I'd find either heavy sinking pellet food or I would uh, use some way to squirt the food down low. You may even need to temporarily turn off the pumps in the tank to stop the flow so it doesn't just blow away if you're trying to get it to certain animals specifically. Sawyer says, any uh, thoughts on Aptasia eating filefish? I uh, have never kept one myself. I, I've heard good things, but I don't have an opinion. Manuel says, my saddleback clown has a tendency to grab cl uh, crabs and dump them at the opposite end of the tank. Any ideas? Yeah, there's really no ideas. I mean, certain fish are going to do that. That's one of those more aggressive clown fish that I was talking about earlier in the stream. We have to just basically, you know, kind of figure out what works in our system and kind of tolerate the weird uh, habits that they may have. Um, Francisco says, a while back you spoke about a zoa that wouldn't open and you told it had a string white thing on it. I can't find the video. What did you do? Uh, at the time, those, those were kind of like larger pallies, not the, the tiny zoanthids. And all the pulps were closed up. Or one would try to open, but there was, it was almost like a rubber band around the wrist, kind of what it looked like. It was this white thread. And I was like, what the heck is that? Why is it on there? That doesn't look normal. And I remember trimming it off with some kind of like a dental tool. I just kind of like pried it or, or broke the thing and scraped it off. Um, you can always dip corals like in something like Revive and use a very soft bristle toothbrush to brush off the polyps if you have one that seems to be affected with this weird thing. Fortunately, it wasn't like an all the time thing. It was like this weird thing that, I mean, it was, it was strange. It seemed to, <laughs> for lack of a, better word it, it seemed like it was gonna circumcise this <laughs> it just was very odd and it would not open up properly until i got rid of that once i got rid of whatever was on there they started opening up normally again and by the way speaking of them right here in the front in this right under spock i know it's blurry but i'll get a good close-up picture there's this group of uh large pallies they're probably not anything important they probably don't have a good name <laughs> but what they have is they're all different colors so I want to get a nice shot of that because I'm like, wow, that's neat. Because there was like two in that spot. And now there's like nine, but they don't all match each other. And I'm really, I mean, the, the shape is the same, but the patterns and colors are different. It's really pretty. Now, if I had 10,000, I'd probably hate them. But right now, that's a really cool thing. So I do want to get a nice picture of that. Oh, no. Someone says the chat was freezing up for them a little bit. I just realized I did this entire live stream without plugging in my Ethernet cable. I apologize. It's a little late for me to plug it in now. We're just going to keep going and hopefully survive this. I really wish I could keep up with the chat better during the conversation. And now I see everyone saying, Heniocus, Heniocus, you're thinking of Heniocus. <laughs> I'm always 10 minutes behind. Uh, great question. Winterwater wants to know, can you keep a wrasse in a bare bottom tank long term? Some wrasses don't need to live in sand. They actually sleep in the rock work. They will, like the mystery wrasse, I believe, is the one that will cocoon its body. It's either the mystery wrasse or the melanurus wrasse. Both are nice wrasses. Um, very pretty to look at. Mystery is a little bit semi-aggressive uh, in comparison to the melanurus. But one or both of those makes a bubble around its body every night, a, a cocoon of, of uh, slime. And then it's a protective bubble that it sleeps in, and then it bursts out of it. And if you happen to look in the right spot, you'll see some of it still remaining in the rock work, which I guess the bristle worms eat. Um, 
and that one doesn't need sand. So that one would be fine in a bare bottom tank. But there are other ones that are sand dwellers like the yellow coarse wrasse. And that will dive down into the sand every single night at the exact moment the lights are about to turn off. And it is fantastic how attuned they are to the clock. And I used to watch and I'd see the fish kind of swimming around in a circle like Jack does when Jack's about to lie down on the bed and she does this circle thing and then she clunks down to make this perfect dog ball. And this wrasse will swim around in a circle, like picking out that perfect spot. And then literally as the light clicks off, shoom, she goes into the sand to sleep for the night. And I was like, man, how do you know the exact moment? And so I kind of watched like several nights in a row. I even set an alarm to remind me to look at the tank right at the moment the lights are about to shut off. Like clockwork, that fish knew. So if you have a tank that's bare bottom and you have a fish, a, a wrasse that needs to live in sand, one of the tricks that some people do is they put a bowl like a Rubbermaid in the corner of the tank filled with sand so that wrasse has a little place to sleep. Sort of like you having a waterbed in your dry house for a place to sleep. I mean, it's kind of the same situation. But uh, to put in a wrasse that lives in sand in a tank that has no sand seems like a really bad choice. It's just as unnatural as you can get, and I wouldn't recommend it. Jason, you did tell me about Spock not being a, <laughs> a true blonde, but that was like two years after Lori told me. I'd heard about it a long time ago. It's just one of those things that you know sticks with you for a long time. Uh, CT says, how long can an ICP test stay in transit? If it's more than two days, will it affect the results in any way? Uh, actually, a question I have to go in conjunction with your question is, if the sample freezes on the way to the testing facility, would that affect results? I don't know the answer to that. It might be worth giving them a call or sending them an email and asking them what they recommend. Um, normally, we are able to ship our things, which takes a couple of days, because we're mailing it first class. That's not overnight. And we get, you know, everyone, I mean, some other stuff's being shipped overseas to be tested in Germany. So it's more than a couple of days. And it could be why, for example, certain things are not measured, like alkalinity or pH, because it's been in the vial too long. But uh, I would ask them directly what their thoughts are to get more scientific answers other than my opinion. Thomas says, my phosphate is one. Is that okay or not? It's too high. We want to be way lower, like 0.1 would be much better than one, and even less than 0.1 would be even better. Oh yeah, the engineer goby is not really an ideal reef fish, honestly. They're okay, but they're kind of, well, first of all, they're like a snake. I'm not a fan of snakes. Um, and they will burrow under your rock work and can cause the rock work to collapse. I knew one person that actually ran PVC pipe through the tank sand bed so that this, uh, yeah, engineer Gobi, I want to make sure I said the right thing. Engineer Gobi could use that as its home with the openings open on each end of the sand bed, but the rock work would never drop. And I thought that was pretty smart, but yeah, I think those can eat other things and they could eat some tank mates, especially things that are smaller that would not be able to dart out of the way quickly enough. And you know, the engineer Gobi kind of has sort of a large mouth, so it wouldn't be ideal. You know, I mean, there's um, the panther, especially the little tiny, the spotted panther fish. They're really adorable when they're small. Oh my God, they're so cute. But they grow to be a fish, whole fish, chomp, like a lionfish, just one bite gone. That's why we don't have them in a reef tank, but they're so pretty to look at, but they'd be fine in a fish only as long as you could provide them adequate food. But uh, certain things like the engineer goby, it's not really a fan of mine to have in there. There are some eels you can put in your tank that seem to get along very well. Uh, the golden dwarf moray eel is my preference. There are a couple of other eels. I didn't even mention those when I was talking about reef safe fish. I mean, eels are in the fish family, believe it or not. They should be in the snake family, right? But um, they, there are some that you can have in there that are okay. Others, they're going to be too aggressive and would be a bad choice. And then like the blue ribbon eel, I haven't heard anyone talk about that lately, but I've seen it show up in my Facebook feed as one of those Instagram stories that you know cross-pollinates. And they're so pretty to look at. But a long time ago, 
I know we were told they don't do well in a reef tank and they're best off left in the ocean. I don't know if that's changed. Do you, any of you know the answer to that? Has, has anything gotten simpler with those or do we just not get them anymore? I don't even know. I never see one in a fish store, but I also don't hang out in fish stores nonstop like many of you do. So if someone knows something about the blue ribbon eel, I'd love to hear just the latest. Even if it's like, no, you still can't have one. I'm fine with knowing that. I just like to know what people think in 2022. Um, Sanchea says, is it normal that alkalinity will go down daily from 8.3 to 7.7? .7? Is that alkalinity or is that pH? Um, but calcium is steady at 450 to 460. Thought the calcium would go down as well. Um, if you are talking about alkalinity, I mean, that's quite a swing of alk dropping. I mean, 0.6 in a day. You're going to need to dose your alkalinity probably twice a day to keep up with the demand. Um, but your calcium tends to stay. It doesn't drop like you would think. We do dose the proper amount to maintain a, a, the calcium level always the same, but um, you won't see a, a change. Like if you test calcium day after day after day for like seven days in a row, I don't think you're gonna see much of a change. I usually don't. My tank tends to be around 400 always, no matter what I do. But alkalinity can definitely do what it wants. And pH of course also moves around quite a bit. So by, dosing alkaline and you want to dose your alkaline in the morning and you want to dose your calcium in the evening because you dose your alkaline in the morning when your pH is at the lowest point to help buffer up the pH in the tank and that also would put alkaline in the tank for the beginning of the day so that when the corals wake up and start to want to grow they have alkaline to absorb and you also want to make sure that you trickle in the alkaline very slowly so that way it um, does not turn solid into a shale and just collapse in a snowstorm. We want it to mix into the water turbulently as it's going in. So if you're using a dosing pump or if you're pouring it in by hand, if you have you know a return nozzle shooting water into your tank and you have your little dosing cup in your hand, you're pouring, you pour it in very slowly, maybe 30 seconds of slowly pouring in 10 milliliters of liquid, just trickle, 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 trickle. And you'll just see it kind of like oil and water mixing but you don't see like white flakes. If you're seeing white flakes, it's precipitating out and it became worthless. It did nothing for your tank. So it needs to go in very gradually for like I said, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, very, very slowly. If you're using a dosing pump, you can definitely control the trickle, but it needs to trickle into an area of high flow because otherwise if it's just kind of an area that's quiet in your sump and it trickles in, it kind of just collapses and you'll see the white shale on the bottom and the side of your sump and it didn't absorb into the water column like you'd hope. Uh, if you are putting into the sump in an area of low flow, take a tiny power head and put it directly under that area blowing upward. So it creates a cavitation of water tumbling. And then as the water trickles in from your different dosings, it is mixing into that and getting into the water column. Uh, Glenn says, did you have to train uh, the copper band to eat prepared food? And if so, how did you do it? I wanted one, but I heard they can be really hard to keep. Yes, they are difficult to keep. Um, what I did is I asked the fish store to feed it in front of me so I could see. And I saw it eat that food and I said, sell me that food too. <laughs> and so I came home with the fish and the food that was working. And I made sure to give that to my copper band. Then I put it through safety stop, which is a it, it takes two hours. It's a two-part bath, and I put it through that to remove external parasites. And then it went into a thing called the Peacemaker that I hang in my tank, which is this acrylic box that has a lot of holes on the sides. And I suspend it over my tank, and I put the copper band in there. And that way it sees the reef, and the reef sees it, but they don't fight. And this stressed-out, brand-new fish that's releasing a stress hormone literally into the water column that freaks out the other fish, 
it allows this to dissipate over the next few days. The copper band is safe in a box, cannot be hurt by any fish, and I would squirt in that food multiple times a day and then put food in the reef as well to make sure the copper band was getting food without any kind of competition. So I'm putting the food, just like if you were to put the copper band in a quarantine tank by itself, every time you put in food, there's nothing there to steal the food. The copper band has plenty of time to eat, and then you siphon away what wasn't consumed to keep the water from getting polluted. In my situation, it's in the reef, so the filtration takes care of it, and the copper band can that I'm offering. I also, at the time, had tried putting in some feather duster worms. I had like a whole bunch of these hitchhikers, and I dropped them in there thinking, oh, it's gonna eat these and like cotton candy. Didn't touch one, did not care. But I also went ahead and bought some blood worms from my fish store, which are frozen, and I'd thaw them out and I would drop in blood worms every single time because I know copper bands like worms. They really like black worms, but we don't have black worms readily available where I live. Apparently in California, you can get them all day long, but for some reason, Texans can't have black worms. But uh, I was using the blood worms and I was watching the copper band would slurp them up like little bits of spaghetti. I was like, okay, good, you're getting a meal. And I bought a ton, I mean like a giant bag, like this big, filled with live adult brine shrimp and just poured it into the reef. So there was like a thousand or I don't know, 10,000 brine shrimp going everywhere and all the fish went crazy, but the copper band was like, choop, 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 and getting food. And I knew I couldn't keep doing that. I mean, that's just too expensive. I'd have to grow my own and I wasn't you know, prepared to do it. So I was focusing on the blood worms and of course PE mysis and mini mysis from San Francisco Bay. And then of course Rod's food that I put in there and uh, krill. And one day I noticed the copper band didn't care anything about the blood worms anymore and was eating the PE mysis. I was like, problem solved. And so PE mysis goes in every single meal, every single night. I, gotta, I do want to show you guys my package because it's kind of crazy. So you know how I like to use Rod's food. And these are the two I use every single night. Um, so there's Original Blend and then there's this one here. No, I'm sorry, Original Blend. And this one's called Pacific Plankton. And it's got little tiny, um, well, it just says Pacific Plankton, but uh, Euphasia species. Uh, so these are the two I like to use, okay? Got a sense of scale. And then I like to put in some of this. Mini mysis, and you can see all of the mysis in there. So here's the sense of scale again. <laughs> and then I get the PE mysis. Dun, dun, dun. It's so big, it's monstrous. It's a big old thick brick. Here's the Rod's food again, compared to the PE mysis. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? <laughs> so this is the stuff I use in my tank every single night. I'm gonna go put them back in the freezer before they melt. Uh, and I just break a piece off of each one of those packages, put it in a small bowl. Um, lately, I've been using RO water from my little tap, and I fill it up, and I thaw it out real fast, and then I pour that into all the different tanks to feed all the fish. Um, Steve says, I went to my local fish store and bought some Red Sea salt as an alkalinity of 12. It was the only one they had, but my tank is only at eight. Any ideas on how to raise it safely? So are you trying to raise your tank up to 12, or are you wanting to bring the 12 down to something closer to the eight you'd like to keep it at? Uh, if you let the salt water just sit in suspension mixing in a barrel, the alkalinity will drop over the next couple of days, and you might find that it gets to that sweet spot to where you can then just use it with your tank and not have to think about it. If you wanted to buffer up your tank up to a higher number so it's closer to your saltwater mix, you can. But also keep in mind, you're changing a percentage of your tank. So if you're changing 10% of the water with an alkaline of 12, and 90% of your water is going to stay alkaline of 8, you might see the alkaline bump up to like 8.2, 8.3. It'll be kind of a little slight hiccup, and you'll kind of level out. If you were doing this all the time, or if you're doing huge water changes, yes, that 8 change into 12 is a big deal. <clears throat> if you're doing automated water changes where it's doing like two gallons a night every single day of the week, 
it's again a tiny percentage you know like one percent of your water is being changed per day i don't think you'll see a change in alkalinity you may actually have to buffer a little bit less alkalinity if that if that even makes a difference but um if you needed to use brand new salt water and you're doing a big water change because you know you just treated for cyanobacteria you could use something like muriatic acid or white vinegar to lower the alkalinity of the brand new salt water to get it closer to your reef before the big water change to keep everything even. So that's kind of the three ways of handling your situation. And then Kevin also has a salt water test. My reef crystals is testing at 520, my tank is at 570. Any suggestions what to do? Um, actually, I would do nothing about that. I would just keep using your reef crystals because your calcium is too high right now. We want to be 375 to 450 and both your new salt and your current tank are both measured almost 100 higher than they need to be. So I would just not dose any calcium at all for the time being and see if those numbers start coming down a little bit. Alex says, how coarse is too coarse for wrasses? I have a pretty coarse sand. I'd like to have a silver belly or a coarse wrasse. Well, it needs to be sand. If you were, I think coarse, we think of something like crushed coral which looks completely different than sand. Um, the sand that's in my tank is variations between two and three millimeters, and it's called reef flake. But it doesn't look like flakes at all. It looks like sand. So if yours was maybe as much as five millimeters, that'd probably be okay still. But if it's like crushed coral, that's like chips of coral. And I am pretty certain that if a ras tried to dive into it, it would just cut itself up on it. So you want to be able to make sure it's something that this fish can go in and out of without being harmed. Um, Manuel says, do you have this pocketbook, the 101 best uh, saltwater fish by Scott Michael? I don't think I do. I have some books, but I don't think I have that one. Oh, that PE Mises was expensive. I think I paid about 80 bucks too. I mean, it's huge. And I just go in there and I, I like the next size down, but he didn't have it. He had the big one. I was like, oh, here's my credit card. <laughs> so it's all right. Uh, Insane Reefer says, I love the tang with a white tail. Um, I kept calling that a hybrid. And then people told me that's not a hybrid. I'm like, oh, okay. It's a coal tang. That's what I know. I don't know anything more about it. I remember... I saw the picture of it on Facebook, Sea Dwelling Creatures as a distributor of fish, and they posted this picture, and I sent the picture to Frank and said, Frank, I want this fish. <clears throat> and he wrote back a text. He says, no problem, you'll be here tomorrow. And I'm just like, wait, how much is this fish? And he's like, you'll have it tomorrow. <laughs> I was just like, oh my God, what did I just commit to? And uh, you know, literally the next day I had this fish, and then finally I was like, Frank, how much is this fish? I don't remember. It was probably like 125 or something, but uh, I've had it for years. I really do like that fish, and I like how active it is. Adam says, your comments about wanting an organization to help defend our reefing hobby reminds me of the American Kratom Association. They've successfully shut down state, federal, and international laws. Hey, I like that group. Maybe we should get them to help us. I don't know what that group is, but no, it does seem like we need something. And I think we've needed something for a very, very long time. And I, I believe there's going to be some pushback and some resistance from the simple hobbyists all the way up to the big industri you know, industrial companies because no one wants to be told how to do things. But I do believe that if these, you know, let's just take BRS. I'm not throwing them under the bus. I'm taking an example. It's a very, very well-known company. It just got a huge infusion of cash from investors. You know, it's clearly doing something right making millions of dollars a year. If this thing changes how the hobby works and cuts out like 90% of what you could normally get for your aquarium, if you suddenly found that it's just easier to get rid of a tank than to even bother trying because your choices are so limited that it cuts into their dollar, you know, the dollars and cents, I mean, it will cut into sales big time. They're not gonna sell nearly as many things that people need because right now we're trying to keep a plethora of animals. So, I mean, 
they should be like, holy crap, this is unbelievable. And, you know, be saying things as well as us little guys, right? And I run a little tiny company. And honestly, if, um, if the whole hobby just kind of shut down, there would be a lot of things I wouldn't sell anymore. There's still things I could sell. And there's things I could sell. And you know what? I mean, again, we keep talking about the, the aquarium hobby. And we're talking about the saltwater hobby, which is like a smaller niche of the aquarium hobby, which is freshwater. And even, you know, I mean, the Lacey Act didn't say all the freshwater fish are safe. <laughs> it's, it's the amendment that's being pre presented would affect all of these different hobbies. It's, it's not just me saying, oh, no, we can't get Achilles tangs anymore. It's nothing that simple. This is way, way worse. Nick covered everything. I mean, I was just like, holy crap. So, and I really think, like I said, I have this feeling it all started with there's a problem in Florida and this one senator wanted to handle that and make this a law so this never happens again and made this proposal that actually affects everybody <laughs> way more than having too many, you know, whatever it is they have. I, I can think of the creature in my head. They're not geckos. They're lizards, right? They're big lizards. They just fall out of the trees. Uh, they had too many of them. And so they're sick of it. And I don't blame them for being sick of it. I'm sure they want them all gone, you know. But uh, I think it was something that was that simple that became, a, that now it's like, because the verbiage is so vague. And it could be why it won't go through, that it, it cannot possibly pass, because hopefully the Senate can say that's ridiculous. But, but they wouldn't say it's ridiculous if no one says anything to them. So that's why we the entire industry and the entire hobby and the other hobbies and their entire industries. Everyone needs to be screaming out loud, this is this is a bad law. You know, this one should not just quietly go through. And the first half already went through. I mean, like I said, it went through before the notification went out to tell us about it. I remember reading the article and it said, you know, the vote will happen on the second, the decision can be on the fourth. And I'm looking at my watch and I think it was like the fourth. I'm like, well, what can we possibly do? This thing apparently happened two days ago. But, um, yeah, we'll see. I don't know. Iguana, thank you. Yeah, iguana. Well, that's a lizard. <laughs> so, all right, guys, uh, we've been talking too long. Uh, it's been over two hours. I do want to remind you today is water test Saturday. Please do test your water. I'm about to go test mine because I need to. I want to know what's going on with my tank. I want to blow off my corals to see if I can find any more flatworms. And uh, it's so important that we do test our tanks. And I know I... I harp on this and preach about it but i read so many comments where people still say i don't test like you tell me to <laughs> or i'm finally testing because you told me to even though i've been saying it every week for four years in a row testing your water saves lives this is something that caitlin said and caitlin was very important to me tomorrow is the one year anniversary of her death and so even more so i want to honor her you know in that we all do our water tests today do it for caitlin guys do it for your reef do it for me do it because it's the right thing to do. It's part of the husbandry. You didn't buy the test kits not to use them, did you? So we want to test our water, make sure our alkalinity is stable, calcium, magnesium, nitrate, phosphate, potassium, salinity, temperature, everything is where it needs to be. And we want to be super alert. I mean, this time of year with the weather being different, the houses are colder, the CO2 is rising in your home from heating, You've got uh, maybe less humidity, so more top off, which could be adding more kalkwasser than you normally add. I mean, there's so many things that can be changing with the water chemistry. And if you are not testing every single week, things are going to be away from you. And usually the correction to fix something costs much more after it's bad than if you just have to make a minor adjustment now to catch it before things go bad. Anyway, I hope that you guys have a great weekend and I will see you again. Yeah, I'll see you again next weekend, I think. <laughs> because I do have a trip coming up and but I we're gonna have a live stream next Saturday so I'll see you guys online and uh, thank you again for